Thank you everyone for being here this evening. It's amazing that we have social time before real time, but come time for real time, everybody gets quiet all on your own. So congratulate yourself for that. You're doing a good job. Thank you so much for being here this evening. I'd like to welcome you to the 18, April 16th meeting of the Jefferson County Board of Education. Traditionally, we have a moment of silence at the beginning of our meeting, and you can determine what you want to think about during this time. National news gives us pause. Local news gives us pause. There are many reasons to, for pause. So at this time, if we could just have a moment of silence, please. Thank you. If you would please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. This evening, Board Member Brady will share our vision statement. Mr. Brady. Thank you, Chair Porter. Our vision statement is as follows. All Jefferson County Public School students graduate prepared, empowered, and inspired to reach their full potential and contribute as thoughtful, responsible citizens of our diverse, shared world. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure at this time to introduce Ms. Tony Kahn's Tatman that will do our recognitions and resolutions. Ms. Tony, welcome and thank you. Sorry, I can't stop everywhere. Sorry. All right, it's on. All right. Good evening, Dr. Polio Board Chair Diane Porter and members of the Jefferson County Board of Education. This evening, we have the honor of recognizing the outstanding accomplishments of students, teachers, principals, and our schools. We begin tonight with the recognition of three students and three teachers who won a Breaking Barriers Spotlight Award from the Metro Disability Coalition during a ceremony on March 18th. Now in its 20th year, the Metro Disability Coalition honors community leaders and other unsung heroes across various fields who go above and beyond the call of duty to assist those in need. This year's recipients include DuPont Manual High School student Ella Robinson, who was selected for her participation in her school and community. She is the Best Buddies of Kentucky Mission Partner Award recipient for raising $14,000 in eight weeks. She participates in community fundraising as a model with the Down with Derby, Down Syndrome of Louisville, Talent Show, and the Best Buddies Friendship Walk. Englehart Elementary student, D'Angela McMillan, who was nominated for overcoming, overcoming disability and barriers both in school and the community. While she may have been born with some physical limitations, she never lets that hinder her academic performance and also exhibits leadership qualities by demonstrating advocacy and compassion for her fellow students. She is also a member of several community service organizations. Newcomer Academy student Amosi Billimbelli, who has worked hard to overcome his significant visual impairment. His family fled violence in the Dem Democratic Republic of the Congo and arrived in the United States in 2016. He has not only learned a new language and acclimated to a new culture, but he has learned to use assessive technology to accommodate his impairment. He is also a very kind classmate. One day helped a new student who happened to have perfect vision find homework in his backpack. Fern Creek High School teacher Lauren Neiman, who is honored for creating an outdoor classroom space that is accessible in accordance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Her students were able to do this work through an extensive collaborative effort between Fern Creek High School and their surrounding community. They collected bottle caps to create um, an ADA compliant picnic tables for seating. Heiser Hearing and Language Academy teacher Katie Tellick who is honored for enriching the lives of her students. Last year, she played a very big part in the development of the school's nationally recognized Stream Lab that was developed to help deaf or hard of hearing students learn science, technology, reading, engineering, and math. 
and Western High School teacher Krista Riley, who is honored for her commitment to students with disabilities. She has been an ECE teacher at Western for seven years, and during that time, she has piloted, piloted the peer support program within the school to as, assist with inclusiveness and building friendships between students with, with disability, without disabilities. I will do this by board area. So Dr. Polio, Board Chair Do uh, Diane Porter, Chief Academic Officer Dr. Coleman, and Executive Administrator of High Schools Chris Perkins, please come forward to extend our congratulations to Ella Robinson. And joining her in the recognition is her principal, DuPont Manual High School principal, Daryl Farmer. And next, if we can have D'Angela McMillan come forward um, with uh, also board chair Diane Porter, uh, Dr. Coleman, um, and assistant superintendent Paige Hartstern, if she is here. And joining her in her recognition is her principal, um, Dr. Ryan McCoy from Englehart. <laughs> And if Dr. Kolb could come forward, Dr. Kolb, Dr. Coleman, uh, Assistant Superintendent of Middle Schools, Michelle Dillard, please come forward to extend our congratulations to Omosi and joining him in the recognition is his principal, Newcomer Academy Principal Gwen Snow. All right, board member Chris Brady, and Dr. Coleman, executive, or I guess it's a, I saw Dr. Beatty is here, uh, of high schools, please come forward to extend our congratulations to Lauren Neiman, and joining her in the recognition is her principal, Rebecca Nicholas. Sorry. Board Chair Diane Porter, if you can come forward, uh, as well as Dr. Coleman, and extend our congratulations to Katie Tellick. And joining her in the recognition is Acting Director of ECE, Angelique Schur, and Principal Jackie June. <laughs> Ms. Porter, if you can stay up there, and uh, Michelle Dillard, if you could also come forward and extend our congratulations to Krista Riley, and joining her in the recognition is her principal, Shalonda Foster. And congratulations to each of you. I would also like to ask that if the family members or parents of any of these students and teachers are here tonight, please stand and be recognized. Next, we have the privilege of honoring several students who have received honors in the Educators Rising Kentucky competition. Educators Rising Kentucky is a nonprofit student club organization for middle and high school students interested in the field of education related careers. 
Among other things, the club helps students build resources and create connections that can significantly impact educational opportunities through co-curricular and extracurricular activities. The following students place first in different categories in the competition. In creative lecture, Ballard High School student Van Dotson. In public speaking, Fairdale High School student Tabitha Caldo. In exploring administrative careers, Seneca High School student Devon Taylor. In exploring non-core subject careers, Seneca High School student Alexis Martin. In children's literature, Wagner High School student Valeria Brochero. In lesson planning humanities, Wagner High School student November Offit. And I'm going to call them up by board area again. So board member Craig, if you could join Dr. Polio. And chief of schools, Dr. Horton, executive um, Assistant Superintendent of High Schools, Glenn Beatty, please come forward to congratulate Van and joining him in the recognition uh, is from Ballard High School. And Dr. Kolb, if you can come forward, um, and also uh, Dr. Beatty, please extend congratulations to Devon and Alexis, and joining them in their recognition is Seneca Principal Kim Morales and teacher Courtney Taylor. And Dr. Kolb and Dr. Horton and uh, Dr. Beatty, if you can stay up there to extend congratulations to Valera and no November and joining in their recognition as their principal, uh, Wagner High School, uh, Sarah Hitchings. And Tabitha could not be here tonight, Ms. Duncan, so we will make sure that she gets her certificate uh, over to Fairdale. She was not able to make it tonight. Uh, we also have with us in attendance tonight that uh, came as well, who is recognized for taking second place in the Educators Rising Moment category. So if um, Dr. Polio and uh, Diane Porter could come forward and recognize uh, Lynn Nguyen from Central High School. And she is here with her teacher, Adrian Lane. And if any of the parents or family members of these students are here tonight, please stand to be recognized. <laughs> Next, we have the privilege of honoring uh, several JCPS students for taking first place honors in the Kentucky Derby Museum's Horsing Around with Art Contest. Now in its 33rd year, the Kentucky Derby Museum's Horsing Around with Art Contest invites students from across Louisville to showcase their take on the Kentucky Derby in different artistic style, media, and form. The competition is open to students in grades 1 through 12 from Louisville's public, private, or parochial schools. This year, 30 schools submitted 223 pieces of artwork for the competition. Four JCPS students took first place honors in this year's competition. In the primary division, we have Norton Commons Elementary School student Blake Ignato. 
In the intermediate division, you have Norton Commons Elementary School student Priyal Patel. In the middle school division, we have Barrett Traditional Middle School student Olivia Simi. And in the high school division, DuPont Manual High School student Maddie Mathau. Dr. Polio board member James Craig and Assistant Superintendent of Elementary Schools Joe Leffert, please extend congratulations to Blake. Joining in the recognition is Norton Commons counselor Sarah Witt Lindy and our teacher Sarah Maxwell Miller. And Priyal could not be here today, so we'll make sure that she receives the certificate over at Norton Commons. And then Dr. Bol Polio board member Dr. Kolb and Assistant Superintendent of Middle Schools, Michelle Dillard, please extend congratulations to Olivia. And joining her in the recognition is her teacher, Megan Holzknecht. And Ms. Porter, if you can come on up with uh, Dr. Beatty, and please extend congratulations to Maddie. And joining in her recognition is her principal, Daryl Farmer. And I don't know how they pick all of these artwork. I went through the entire photo gallery. It's just beautiful. They're just absolutely gorgeous. And if the family members and parents of uh, these children are here tonight, please stand and be recognized. <laughs> and finally tonight, we have the honor of recognizing three Thomas Jefferson Middle School employees and the school resource officer for their compassionate and heroic act of saving the life of a student. In late January, TJ Middle School teachers Holly Gilbert and Scott Lawrence, instructor Eric Abbott, and the school resource officer Deanna Thomas helped save the life of student Jamaron Wood, Woodard. The 14-year-old student was playing kickball in the gym during his physical education class when he suddenly froze and dropped to his knees and fell forward. PE teacher Scott Lawrence immediately radioed for help and within minutes was being assisted in CPR by CRO, the, the school resource officer Deanna Thomas, science teacher Holly Gilbert, and the instructor Eric Abbott. The four took turns administering the life-saving procedure until EMS arrived. Doctors and the emergency crew told the family that without a doubt, the quick response of the school professionals saved the life of their son, who was in full cardiac arrest and had flatlined on the gym floor. He spent 11 days in the hospital after having bypass surgery on his left artery. Doctors have now given him the all clear to continue his passion of playing sports, something that he cannot wait to start doing again. Dr. Bol Polio board member Corey Scholl and assistant superintendent of middle schools, Michelle Dillard, please con come forward and offer congratulations to these teachers, instructor, and school resource officer. And also joining them in the recognition is TJ Middle Principal Kim Gregory, their student Jamarion and his family. Please all come up.
And I'm told that Jay will be attending Southern High School this fall. So, Dr. Polio, members of the board, uh, this concludes our recognitions for this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, before I call for the motion, could we get all of our students to stand up so we can do a huge round of applause because we've got a lot of great students in here. Thank you very much. Keep up the good work. We're very proud of you, and it's uh, a great opportunity for us to have you with us this evening. At this time, is there a motion to receive the recognitions? Board Member Brady, second by Board Member Geese. All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Now there's a, about a two-minute opportunity to make a big run to the door, or else we lock the door and you stay with us. Thank you very much, parents. Thank you very much, JCPS staff, and congratulations. We're going to move on with the agenda and the next question to ask, I think we're moving on with the agenda. <laughs> At this time, is there a recommendation to approve the meeting agenda for this evening? Uh, board Member Geese, seconded by Board Member uh, Craig. All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. The next recommendation is for approval of minutes of the previous meeting. Uh, 
There were minutes for March the 12th, uh, which was a regular meeting, March the 19th, special meeting, and March the 26th, special meeting. Is there a recommendation for approval of these minutes? Board Member Geese, seconded by Board Member Shul. All those in favor? Unanimous, thank you. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our superintendent, Dr. Marty Polio, with the superintendent's report. Dr. Polio. Thank you, Chair Porter and board members. It's uh, difficult to follow those uh, student recognitions, especially the one from Thomas Jefferson at the end, but I'll give it a go. Uh, I bring to you the superintendent report for April 16th. Um, throughout all the challenges we've been dealing with JCPS over the past two years, you know we've been doing the transformative work of changing in, uh, systems instruction and support for our students every day at every school. Um, and without a doubt, there's been no shortage of audits or reviews that have taken place within this district over the past 24 months. In the past week, we received the results of our advanced ed, a district accreditation visit that also served as our KDE diagnostic review. Uh, in the past decade, JCPS has received an accreditation visit three times. We had one in 2013, one in 2016, and then our three-day visit from the uh, team, the extensive visit, was in January of 2019. Uh, the accreditation and visit involved three intense days where the review team interviewed many stakeholders, uh, central office staff, uh, leadership teams, parents, uh, community members, and then obviously school personnel visited dozens of schools and hundreds of classrooms over their three-day period. So as always, the review showed that we have a long way to go and much work to do as we move forward. Uh, but I wanted to um, give a report on what we heard, and I'm extremely encouraged by the results of the accreditation report. The reports are broken down into standards for an effective district. The standards are scored as needing improvement, emerging, meeting expectation, or exceeding expectation. The following is a breakdown uh, for each of the three years. So overall, 2019 results showed the highest percentage of meeting or exceeding expectations out of any of the standard or out of any of the reviews in the past decade. In 2013 review, JCPS met or exceeded 14% of the identified standards. In 2016, JCPS met or exceeded only 9% of the standards. In 2019, we grew to meeting or exceeding nearly 40% of the standards identified by advanced ed. For the 28 comparable standards in the review, the standards did change slightly from 2013 to 2019. 43% of the standards had higher ratings than the previous audit, and about 45% had the same rating as just three years ago. Specifically, there are two standards I wanted to identify that I think really talk about the work that we do. First of all, 3.7. The system demonstrates strategic resource management that includes long-range planning and use of resources in support of the system's purpose and direction. And also 1.10, leaders collect and analyze a range of feedback data from multiple stakeholder groups to inform decision making that results in improvement. The past two audit in these standards, the district did not meet expectation, the lowest rating we could have. In 2019, JCPS exceeded expectations in these two standards, which is the highest rating we could have. A couple of other highlights in the leadership standard, JCPS met or exceeded 25% of the standards in 2016. In 2019, JCPS met 73% of the standards. In the resources standard, JCPS met 0% of the standards in 2016, while meeting 50% of the standards in 2019. Also, as, you, uh, as I've reported to you, we clearly saw increases in our scores in the index of education quality, which is our overall score, which was 281.94, which shows a school district that is nearing the impact phase, and in our Elliott scores, which are visits to all of our classrooms. Each of the six standards in the Elliott scores were higher than 2013 or 2016. The team also expressed confidence that we are heading in the right direction. The team from Advanced Ed recognized a new standard of high expectations, which is leading to a culture of hope and renewed energy in JCPS. 
The report detailed information about the leadership team having the skills to develop the strategies that could lead to a major turnaround in this school system. And finally, there was a lot written about the backpack of success skills and how that initiative has the potential to transform instruction it was attend as, as was intended in Vision 2020. So overall, very positive scores and news. Um, I did want to talk about some of the identified areas of growth for our district because I think it's important that we take this information and continue to work to improve. So first, we must continue to ensure fidelity of implementation of our three pillars and our six systems across all 156 of our schools. So the teams did find a varied level of implementation of backpack and systems from school to school, um, and we have to work to make that systemic across every school. Um, it was clear that we must provide improved professional development for our teachers, especially in regards to deeper learning and implementing the pillars and making sure that all teachers have the capacity uh, to implement this work. We talked a lot about the vertical and horizontal, horizontal alignment of curriculum between schools and at all levels to ensure that every student in every classroom um, is re receiving that high level of instruction. And then a standards-based approach to instruction is clearly an area of improvement, which is our system one, which we're really honing in on now. But overall, as I said earlier, we have a long way to go, but I really believe this is validation that we're on the right path. We got a lot of work to do, but if we continue this work step by step, um, I believe that uh, we are gonna reach our goal um, and be a model district. Lastly, a couple of updates I wanted to provide with you. First, we're in the middle of student defenses of our backpack of success skills throughout the district. All of our fifth graders, eighth graders, and 12th graders, they're currently defending their readiness for the next transition with their backpack of success skills. We were fortunate enough to have a student from Crosby Middle School defend her readiness in front of cabinet yesterday, which was just a model defense um, and was really what we were looking for when we designed it. Um, truly believe this is gonna be a model. It was an inspiration to see this student and really see her meaningful and deeper learning experiences in all of her classes. We're gonna continue this in the final six weeks and I encourage you and anyone else to be a part of these uh, defenses because it truly shows the work that we're trying to do and accomplish here in JCPS. And finally, I wanted to provide an update on our summer learning initiative or our backpack league. We've sent invitations to thousands of third through sixth graders to participate in a four week summer initiative. So by the time we begin, we'll have approximately a thousand students in our own JCPS uh, summer learning plan who will be getting uh, literacy and numeracy um, instruction over the course of the summer, engaging um, activities throughout the summer. We'll also have close to 2,100 students in our community partnerships, which will also have 75 minutes of numeracy and literacy instruction each day. So well over 3,000 students will be served this summer to increase those literacy and numeracy skills and increase student engagement. This is hard, tough work. This is our first swing at it. We think it's gonna grow, but this is the meaningful work that's gonna change outcomes for kids. So we're excited about this work and many other things that we have going on in the district. A lot of things are happening, um, but we know this is the work that's gonna uh, change the way that we provide instruction for kids and outcomes for students. So. Thank you, and this concludes the superintendent report for April 16th. Thank you, Dr. Polio. Moving on with our agenda, I believe our next item uh, will be our speakers. There are two speakers this evening, two on non-agenda items. I wanna make sure I haven't skipped anything. And um, there is uh, something that I will read uh, before we have the speakers this evening that talks about how we uh, have participation uh, during this time. In accordance with board policy 01.421, the Board of Education expects that persons who have signed up to address the board will limit their remarks to the subject that they listed at the time they signed up, that their presentation will not include any abusive remarks about that subject, and that they will present their remarks in a manner that is consistent with the orderly conduct of the meeting. Also, in accordance with board policy, the board reserves the right to limit, extend, or terminate discussion on any subject. Discussion of personnel matters is not permitted as the board has no legal authority regarding such matters, and such discussion is not appropriate. 
Personnel matters are within the authority of the superintendent. If a speaker begins to discuss a personnel matter, the chair shall immediately terminate the speaker's remarks. A speaker may not initiate charges or complaints against an individual district employee. Discussion of a district employee by name or position is not permitted in order to ensure confidentiality and fairness for the employee. If a person discusses a district employee by name or position in their remarks to the board, the chair shall immediately terminate the speaker's remark. The speakers before the entire board are not allowed to use props, displays, or any other objects during their presentations. However, informational handouts may be given to the Assistant Secretary, Angie, for distribution prior to or following the meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board and may not share these minutes with any other speaker. At the end of two and a half minutes, a bell will sound once. You will then have 30 seconds to finish your statement. At the end of three minutes, the bell will sound twice, indicating that your time is up. The superintendent will look into the speaker's issues and, if necessary, represent the board in following up or recommend action to the board. Board Policy 01.45 establishes that persons speaking regarding items on the board agenda shall be permitted to do so prior to persons speaking regarding non-agenda items. A maximum of 45 minutes shall be allocated for speakers immediately after the superintendent's report. Speakers who were unable to be accommodated due to that time limitation may address the board later in the meeting immediately after the board reports. The full board policy concerning public participation in open meetings is available for viewing on our website and at our sign-in sheets. Again, I, uh, we have two speakers this ev evening on non-agenda items. Uh, our first speaker this evening is Kanita Ballard. She's a teacher at Olmstead North, and she wants to speak with us about mental health. Ms. Ballard, welcome, and thank you for being here this evening. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just used to using my teacher voice. I apologize. Um, so yes, again, my name is Kanita Ballard, and I work at the wonderful Olmstead Academy North for Boys. Um, and while I love my job, it's not without its challenges, as the majority of our population, 80%, is high needs. In fact, uh, since I've worked at Olmstead, we've lost a student each year, and I've only been there at four years. So while we see this situation, I would like just to first to I would like to celebrate the fact that the district is looking at our learners not just as academic placeholders, but as individuals. We're seeing the whole of our learners. Um, but to that point, I have three questions in regards to the mental health initiative, um, in regards to is the mental health initiative part of a larger vision for JCPS and which capacity for mental health is built within the school. So it's taking an all hands on deck approach. Are teachers involved in this? Are families involved in this? Speaking of families, how are we bridging the gap between brown and black families um, that have largely considered something like mental health taboo within the community um, with mental health workers. And in regards to the mental health workers themselves, what additional trainings are required for them? I understand it's part of their initial coursework, but what additional trainings are they receiving to work with our brown, black, and LGBTQ students? Thank you. And any commentary is appreciated if answers are not available. Thank you for being with us, and Dr. Polio and staff, a staff member team will contact you uh, if that's okay. We appreciate you being here this evening. Great questions. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Our next speaker is Bryson Sebastian, and he is going to speak to us about the gratitude for the work done in South End recently. Mr. Sebastian, welcome, and thank you for being here this evening. Um, thank you, Mrs. Board uh, Chair. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bryson Sebastian. Uh, I'm a junior at Butler Traditional High School. Um, I'm here tonight to speak, like she said, to express my gratitude for um, the recent work that the board has really committed to the South End. Um, I was born and ra I'm born and raised in Valley Station with uh, two parents who graduated from Valley High School. Um, I was actually a student at Wilkerson and Farnsley Middle School. 
And I know the South End is not necessarily the first place that comes to mind when you think of new initiatives in the city of Louisville, um, especially in JCPS where there's other places that generate more revenue and there's other places where commitments are uh, easier to make. And so I would just like to thank the board uh, for all that it's done recently in pushing improvements in the South End, especially with uh, the new school approvals that um, just got passed at the last meeting with the new school going up uh, near Wilkerson and the renovations that are going to go there, um, especially in the YMCA, that uh, the initiative that's trying to be built there. As president of Butler's Student Y Chapter, I know uh, how much the YMCA can help students in their learning and can push that forward. And I just think it's really great that the board has went out and tried to create that uh, partnership. And I think it's going to do a lot for the students. And uh, I would just like to think that the board can continue to do this moving forward, not just in the South End, but in a lot of other places in Louisville that haven't historically gotten the most attention. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for being here this evening. It's our pleasure to have you as a student come to talk to us that we did uh, something right and okay. So thank you so much. We might invite you back. For once, <laughs> for once we did something right. <laughs> The entire board did something right and okay. How's that? So thank you. You're welcome anytime. We'll move on now to our action items. Uh, our first action item is the recommendation for approval of the budget priorities for 2019-20. Dr. Polio, if you would like to introduce this to us, please. Yes. Thank you, Chair Porter and board members. Um, we have gone through a lengthy process on um, budget priorities that began last fall um, where we had an initial conversation um, and we took your input we had a second um, work session in the winter where we continued to get feedback from you brought back what we heard and so tonight we wanted to solidify what we believe is what um, we've worked together to say the things that when we bring you a budget in may that are our priorities and that our what we dedicate funds to um, reflect these budget priorities and that you should see um, throughout this 2019-20 budget. Um, so at this time, I'll turn it over uh, to Cordelia and John, who will present those um, budget priorities that we heard from you, went back and listened to, um, and, and recapped what we thought we could put into a list of budget priorities. Um, first of all, as Dr. Polio was saying, you know, we started out uh, in September with our first work session. Uh, November uh, received some strategies and all, and then January you approved the draft budget. So what we had heard was that um, you wanted us to provide support on the backpack of success skills, which is technology uh, mainly, and other supports that a lot of this information is not yet um, in the tentative budget, but as we proceed along, we will put those, some of the dollars are there, some not yet, because we still have the working budget, as you know, that's going to come forward where we actually get our revenue down to more precise, and then where we hear from you tonight exactly what you want in, as well as maybe some other ideas. Uh, racial equity, uh, that of course is important in our um, new policy. That includes the summer learning. It's giving the opportunity for all children to have opportunities for um, educational uh, programs. Transform the instructional care. That's you know the gifted and talented. We're looking at increasing uh, the support there for gifted and talented literacy and numeracy. Again, a very important support that we are going to provide social emotional supports for students, the mental health practitioners. We have uh, put that initiative forward. That's about a $4.4 million investment that we are making there. Behavior analyst as well as restorative practices. Accelerated improvements uh, schools, we have given a lot of support in that area. One thing to address the teacher retention, we did that with uh, stipends that we have uh, this year actually implemented. And for the AIS schools, we're looking at probably around five to six million dollars where we're actually uh, helping the AIS uh, schools. Exceptional child education, 
there is a commitment to that. It's part of the cap, and we are addressing that, redesigning, and making sure we fall within compliance. We're looking at about $7 million in that area. The Backpack League is our summer program that's going to start. And from what I understand, we have over 400 students already signed up, and I think we're looking at uh, more if we can make that happen. Modernized facilities, you all approved that uh, this last time, and we continue to look at not just building the new schools, but making sure we're doing the renovations that are needed at the other schools too. Alternative school design, uh, we're still working on that as far as at your direction where we're going to head there because um, there has been some changes, but we're going to include some information there also. The next step, the first thing is to get the feedback from you all to make sure this is what you want uh, to do. And there may be other items that are coming forward because we do have other budget requests that schools have made as well as departments in order to enhance what we're doing. So that is the, the basis of where we are. Questions and comments? Ms. Duncan? I have a question about safety. When we first talked about our priorities and went, went through these things, safety was pretty high up on there as something that we wanted to be sure that we have budgeted for. And why is it not on here? Well, first, um, a major part of Senate Bill 1, school safety is around um, mental health professionals and counselors in school. Um, what was the total of mental health professionals that were putting into schools? That's 4.4 uh, .4 million. 4.4 4 million in, in that regards, um, not just to meet Senate Bill 1. I mean, I think it's been clear that that's the direction that we want to head, but I mean, that is a clear part um, of school safety. Um, the second part, as I've said, we're coming back with um, increased um, or an improved plan um, when it comes to um, potential safety and security at schools, uh, but we did not have the ability to bring that forward for the 1920 school year because of some hurdles that we were not able to get past. Um, but that will be coming back um, in the near future. And same thing on student assignment. We had talked about student assignment being, I mean, a, a year for review and um, talking about that as a priority. This student assignment now is uh, being studied. So uh, when will that be returning as a budget priority for us? Well, I mean, I think we have to see what the final thing is before I can say what impact it has on the budget. I mean, I don't know specifically what line items we would be putting in for a tentative budget that we would be bringing to you next month that would be earmarked for just student assignment. Um, clearly, I think whatever changes are going to be made um, would definitely reflect the 2021 budget. Okay. Are we finished? I'm finished. Okay, Board Member Geese. Yeah, and I was um, I was curious as to that question as well. Uh, from your from my understanding, Dr. Polio and Cordelia, it sounds as if um, we are providing funds for safety. It's just tucked in other um, sources. Uh, say, for example, uh, the amount of money we're providing for mental health services for JCPS students and so on and so forth. Is that the way that you would frame that? Um, absolutely. We are not reducing any of our safety. We want to make sure that continues. It's, it is a priority of the district. As far as the large plan, that is something that will be coming forward at a later time. Mm -hmm. I just have the a, a same concern after reading a few things in the press, particularly in the Courier Journal and the publication Insider Louisville. Um, they seem to not really understand that packaging of the budgeting. So I wonder what we could do to alleviate some of those fears in the community mm -hmm. that, yes, we know that in 2019 safety is a huge issue for public education, not only in Jefferson, but across Kentucky, across America. How could we alleviate the fears by letting people know that more readily? Well, I believe that at least half, I mean, I can't say the wording of Senate Bill 1, um, that was a major part of this legislative session, um, and the entire bill was around safety. Mm -hmm. I think a great deal of that bill of school safety really detailed, you know, I don't like to use the terms the hardening and of schools or the softer aspect of, of 
school safety. Um, but I definitely believe that providing services for kids, especially around mental health, is, is a, a critical component of school safety. As a matter of fact, I testified in front of that committee many months ago when it was mm -hmm. being crafted, I think, before the holidays, um, as to the importance of that. So I think that's a big part of it. Um, we still have the possibility, as we said at the work session, of increasing our district security. That would be um, at the district level, and we could bring that back to you at a future board meeting, but we haven't determined at that time if we're moving forward on that yet. Mm -hmm. Right, and I just want to clarify for the record that I'm in full support of what we're doing yeah. for mental health. I think mental health is the proactive piece, um, and I'm happy to see us investing in the proactive um, rather than always focusing on the reactive. But I do think both the proactive and the reactive um, are two critical parts of that equation. Yep. Thank you. Yep. And thank you all. Other questions or comments? Board Member Brady. Thank you, Chair Porter. Uh, I want to reiterate my colleagues' uh, desire or, um, I guess, emphasis on uh, safety and, in particular, school security. Um, we have talked many times about having our own internal security team. Uh, that, to me, should be a budget priority. That should be actually called out specifically on this. And I know there's been some discussions and some things about whether or not the uncertainty of what happens at SB1 of how that was going to be detailed and laid out. Now that it's out there, I think that's something we really need to start planning on and we need to be focusing on, and that needs to be a line item. Um, you know, mental health is obviously in a very, very important part of that, and we should uh, certainly keep that commitment. But in particular, I also want to make sure that we have a highly trained internal security team that is answerable to the administration of this district. Uh, that makes sure that all uh, board policies uh, that are, you know, implemented and approved by this board and therefore by the community are adhered to um, and that we're, our, we have a consistent and uh, a cohesive uh, message and policy that is adhered to throughout our school, uh, throughout all the schools in our district. Um, I do find it concerning that that is not called out specifically within this. Um, regarding the alternative school redesign, obviously that is in flux to a degree. We're going to be talking about that a little bit later on in the, in the uh, meeting. I'm curious to know if we have an idea as to what type of budget we might be looking at that, if that's going to be an additional uh, funds for that. Uh, I think there was also a question that one of the board members asked about our reserve funds, our rainy day fund, and I think we're looking at around, if I memory serves, about $111 million, which is, I don't know if it isn't as, not even 10% of our budget, which is where we would like to be at least for uh, our district. So there's some concerns there, but I'm curious, do you all have a number or an estimate as to what we might be thinking about that, and especially in regards to how it would adhere to some of the um, I think services that we need to provide for uh, these kids, these at-risk kids that we have been criticized in the past for not having or at least not implementing to fidelity. The alternative school? Yes. Um, well, it will um, actually be lower than what we anticipated from our original discussion when we were talking about consolidating the two schools. Um, however, you will hear that some of the contract services and counselors that we'll be providing um, I don't have that number on me. Do we have that exact number? We'll have to, we can provide that for you at the work session next week. Okay. Um, as exactly what we're looking at for that. Okay. And regarding my original point on security team, um, what timeline, if any, what's the plan? So, um, and, and we're happy to add that as a budget priority to this. I mean, that, there's nothing that says we cannot do that. However, we do have to have the capacity to develop that and that clearly is not the hurdle that we were facing was not necessarily financial it was having the capacity to do that and add that and train and have enough officers to be able to do that so um, that's the hurdle we got to get over and we're continuing to work on it so that we can implement it as quickly as we can what's the challenge to, the, uh, to developing the capacity to deal with that well we'd be happy um, if mike you want to come up and talk about that
right now the maximum number of officers that we could put through the academy would be around five a year and that's best case scenario so to scale that within jcps if we were hiring people off the street without a police background to train them to become officers for us is around five a year we had hoped that there would be legislation where there was not a penalty for retired officers to join a school district's security force and not lose their insurance that they get as part of their police retirement. That didn't happen. So there's a, a pretty substantial financial impact that anyone who's retired from the police force recently would face if they came if they came on with us and then additionally it's it's a very expensive endeavor so as we would grow this we would have to grow it very slowly in that regard as well okay um a couple things one from what i'm hearing from from this particular issue in regards to uh, recently retired officers and bringing them in-house uh, that should be a legislative agenda item for next year for this board, if I'm hearing that correctly. It was this year, too. Yeah, I know, but even more so. And then especially considering when, in light of well, the passage of SB1. Because and, and this wouldn't just be our district. It, this was No, and this impacts district. every district yeah. every district in the state. And I don't remember the numbers exactly off the top of my head, but just like most other large institutional organizations, police forces across America – the baby boom is retiring, mm -hmm. or the generation, baby boom generation is retiring. So at the time, we would be looking for people to hire if we had to train them. So are other law enforcement units as, as well. Okay, and regarding the capacity, developing the capacity, that I understand five officers is what you're saying, but that seems incredibly low. And the reason I say that is because we could have just attrition. Uh, we can hire an officer one year, they might last a couple years and then retire, or not retire, but decide this isn't for them. And then we're, that would just push back our capacity all the more. It just seems that it is, that puts us at a very critical level. And ideally, ideally we would hire people with a law enforcement background who, for these type of safety roles that did already have the academy behind them that have been through that. Because in order to be a sworn officer in the state of Kentucky, you've had to go through the academy, and five is our max number. So if we were to scale this rapidly, when, when, you, when you build something, you have to build it with the contingency of what if it doesn't. So we, that's why everything that we have initially modeled has been with five, and we had our fingers crossed that that penalty would would be removed from retired officers. When you say academy, which academy are you referring to? The, the Kentucky uh, Law Enforcement Academy in Richmond, at Eastern Kentucky. And then Metro has an academy of their own as well, right. but they've got that full <laughs> with, their, with their own recruits. So there's no other academies in the state? That's, no. That's pretty that's, much it? Yes. All right. All right, thank you. Board Member Craig. I think I had a different recollection from the February 26th work session, we had a discussion about the fact that Senate Bill 1 was pending and we didn't know what the future of the legislation would be, if it might change, and we didn't know if it might be funded in the next legislative session. So my recollection was a healthy discussion about SROs and what those might look like in the future, but knowing that we didn't know then what the future held and that we didn't have enough time from April or May through the implementation of this budget. I wasn't shocked to see that not on that's the agenda. Is that that's was what we talked about on February that's 26th, correct. right? Correct. So it's still a healthy point of discussion for all of us, but I don't right. think that anybody was expecting us to have a police force next year, right? Right. Well, we had been talking about it for for what, October, uh, no, uh, August of 2017. Yeah. So that has been, that's, that's how long we've been discussing it. But. Ms. Duncan, I think the, the question is, what state are we in next year with SROs? 
uh, what has what is the mayor planning? Do we know what is being planned for next year? Do we are we expecting that no SROs to be in our schools, or are, do we have another year or, or what? What's that? Let me before Dr. Polio answers the question. I, I I think we should shape our questions based on why we're our agenda item and if the question has to do with budget priorities and dollars and cents then okay and I think that I, what I've heard us say in the conversation is that we need more information about how we're moving forward with security uh, I don't want to put an officer name on it because we don't know what it's going to be called the superintendent came to us with the intent of bringing an in-house safe team into our schools so the question that you're ask, asking, Ms. Duncan, I, I, it's okay for Dr. Polio to answer that, but we're beginning to take this conversation to what about where we are, and I just want to make sure that we're giving ample time to discuss budget priorities. So, Dr. Well, Polio? No, I don't, I don't have an answer for you on that. I haven't been informed of anything, so I'm, I'm unaware at this point. So we don't... We don't know. There's no definite anything for us on that. There is not. The questions are concerns. Other questions are concerns. A few things I would like to uh, just put out for information purposes. As we talk about moving forward with budget priorities, uh, I want to make sure that we remember early childhood education remains a priority. We were waiting to know what was going to happen with uh, early childhood education, and I assume we're still waiting to hear from that. At the last yes. conversation, we were waiting for a meeting to be held with uh, Dr. Coleman and I believe uh, Amy Dennis, and uh, I don't think that meeting has occurred, or if it has occurred, uh, okay, so that has not uh, c happened. There's other uh, another question about custodial services. I know that we have gone to a different format and I've spoken to Dr. Polio about giving, getting an update on that, and I think the board will get that. But I think it's important for us to understand the dollars that have been reshaped for custodial services and how that impacts local schools and local buildings because of, there's been some real changes with staffing and how are we meeting the needs of our students and our staff. So I don't know where that is in the budget but I would like to understand how we are doing the work that we are supposed to do as it pertains to custodial services. And then we've uh, uh, I had uh, the school safe staff because I don't know what we're going to call it that is still on there. It's still in consideration. Um, one of the things that came to mind to me this year when we uh, closed our buildings is the concern that I have for taking care of feeding our children. And we stepped up as a district and made that happen. But I guess my question is, in the budget, is there, a crisis, is there money for a crisis plan for when things like that happen? For example, when we have to close our schools, when we open X number of buildings, when we send the food truck out, the concern that I personally have is that 60% of our students are on free and reduced lunch. That means that 60% of our students on those closed days do not only not get lunch, in many cases they do not get breakfast. So I don't know where that is in there, but I am asking that we keep that in mind because it could happen for any reason. It could be a windstorm, it could be a snowstorm, but the bottom line is we have children in this district that need to have uh, food services. And my last question, uh, none of these questions are to be answered tonight, is as we start putting things in and making things happen, I would like for the board to see some kind of report as to where money is coming from. Because if I say I want something or I no longer want it and I'm going to give it to Dr. Chris and I'm going to give my money to Dr. Chris, then I want to know, I want the board to understand how we are moving dollars around. It's not our responsibility to do day-to-day -day operations, but it is our responsibility as a board to vote on resources and how we are resourcing uh, different programs in this district. Again, I don't expect any answers. I know this is just procedural that we're doing this tonight, but in order to be responsive, to the conversations that we hear away from this table at seven o'clock, uh, those are some of the concerns that I have. Anything else? Board no, Member Shule? Thank you. 
I know there will be transitional expenses for um, Liberty and Mary Ryan going to Gilmore and Du Bois going to Liberty. Um, do we know, will those expenses fall under the 2019-2020 budget, or will they, will, are those funds coming from another? They will, they will be in the 19, some, um, some of the expenses as far as the moves would be in the current year. That may happen, depending upon what uh, the timing of it. Okay. But possibly in June. As far as like the shift of the students and the allocation for teachers and that, that will be in the 1920 budget. Okay. And we take care of that through the standard formula. Okay. okay. So some of the expenses will be possibly this year, probably limited, and then the other will come into the 1920. So any um, upgrades or, or um, facility enhancements, say, mm -hmm. for Gilmore Lane in order to be acceptable for Liberty and Mary Ryan, that will come from the 2019-20 budget is what I'm hearing. It's actually uh, some of those, and it depends so. upon the, um, the level of renovations. Okay. It could be in our restricted funding. Okay. which would be in the 1920, but there's always a reserve in order to handle what's needed to be done this current year. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, at this time, is there a motion to approve the budget priorities for 2019-20? Uh, board Member Craig, there's a motion, is there a second? Board Member, uh, <laughs> Dr. Chris, all those in favor? All those opposed? All those were in favor and uh, board member uh, Duncan is opposed to the vote this evening. Thank you very much for your presentation. The next item on our agenda that's an action item has to do with the adoption of the Kentucky School Board Association superintendent evaluation process. Normally I would ask Dr. Polio to introduce this but um, I think based on the the nature. Um, I think this is something that the board should have a discussion about. Last year, the uh, KSBA came to us with a different format for doing the superintendent's evaluation, which we had an opportunity to test, um, and it was a quite extensive process. This year, when we had the KSBA conference uh, downtown at the Galt House, they presented another format. The format is inclusive of all the main points that was in the uh, document last year. I think that there were concerns throughout Kentucky about the, whether the document that we used last year was user friendly or not. So it's the responsibility of this board to determine which format we want to use this year. And that's why it's on the agenda now. We're not talking about the specifics of what the superintendent is doing, we're talking about the format that we're gonna use in order to do the superintendent evaluation. So if there are any questions and comments about that at this time, uh, it's important that we, we have this conversation in an open meeting, so questions and concerns that we might have. And the question is, do we use the process that was last year? And unfortunately, we have two newly elected board members, so you did not get to go through that with us. Um, but you did have an opportunity to be exposed to what we received at KSBA this year at the Galt House. So uh, if we could have a little bit of conversation, and all we are doing this evening is just determining which of the two formats we will use. The information will be the same, but it's what format do we want to use? Questions or comments? Board Member Brady. Um, as far as going from one format to the other format and tracking the performance of last year's superintendent evaluation goals to this year, um, do you, what is the view of the board or the chair uh, regarding how that might crosswalk over to the new format? Does it seem, because it's, it appears on its face to me to align but I'm curious to have that conversation with other board members or the chair as to whether or not we, you know, is that view shared? 
The uh, session that I attended at the God House, they made it sound like it was an easy walk and that it was very, very uh, compatible with all the com uh, everything that we're asked to respond to. We have the same number of items. Uh, the board is not required to respond to each of those items. We, this board would decide when we go uh, start working on the superintendent's evaluation. But I did not hear in the session I attended, and I think Dr. Chris may have been in there with me. Nothing is different. The only thing that is different is the format, what it looks like, and plugging in different things versus more of a narrative evaluation, which we have done in the past. That's that's my recollection of what I heard. And uh, if you, okay, he supports, and each, we heard the same thing. Each section has the ability to be able to put in a narrative if we feel that there are areas within that that really don't, you know, at least in my looking at it, that it, it should provide that. But I just want to say that out loud that at each section we can put in our own things if we feel that something isn't addressed within the check boxes uh, or, the, you know, the, I guess line items that they have already uh, a part of that format. That's correct. And again, the what they presented to us, the option is to do more of a narrative format and there's always an opportunity at the end of the narrative to, to add additional information that may not have been covered by a specific line item. And just from my looking at that compared to the <laughs> spreadsheet from HEC, uh, that was the previous format, uh, I would prefer this one over the, uh, over the one we did last year. And I know in previous evaluations uh, that this board has done over the years, it has more relied on that narrative type of format style, but I do like the fact that there is some framework here to be able to guide that narrative as opposed to, I think, previous uh, evaluations seem to have uh, gone off in, in, in unexpected directions. Okay. Any other comments about um, what our preference would be? And again, I do realize that we have two newly elected board members, but we all get to do this, so uh, please feel free to share your thoughts with us. I thought the, the uh, uh, presentation at KSBA made sense, um, and the timeline is helpful for us to plug and play into the board calendar so that all of us can expect, uh, can know what's coming over the horizon and have a participate uh, opportunity to participate. My question is, the, the, the format anticipates that we would begin in March and we're already here at the end of April, <laughs> we're halfway through April, so are you anticipating we might move this up a month? Well, we after we decide it? what we're going to do, then right. we will start putting uh, dates that are appropriate okay. because um, we're, we can't roll the calendar back. And if we like this format, then next year we can probably be more specific and start a little bit earlier. We started the conversations earlier, but no, we've, we have in fact mis mixed the March point, uh, the deadline. But uh, in talking with our general counsel, he said that he would work with us and make sure that we get the dates aligned accordingly. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Duncan, you had something? Yes, I was just gonna say I'm perfectly happy with the one that we were trained on uh, in February. Okay, any other comments? Hearing none, is there a motion to uh, use the board um, superintendent evaluation format that was presented to us by KSBA Association at our training session this year in February? Is there a motion, uh, board member Geese? and second by board member Craig, all those in favor. It's unanimous. Uh, the document that we used last year is on the shelf and we're gonna move forward with the new document. Uh, thank you, Dr. Polio, uh, you helped us a lot with that. Um, but thank you everyone for expressing your concerns and we will work now to plug in some dates and times to make it correct. And we, it was important and necessary that we make that decision in an open meeting. Moving on to our information items, uh, the acceptance of the progress report on the JCPS final corrective action plan. Um, Dr. Polio. Sure, thank you, Chair Porter and board members. Um, as you know, I presented this same update on the corrective action plan to the Kentucky Board of Education last Wednesday, all the way over in Ashland. Um, we did have one reporter join us all the way over there. The others, I do not think, made the trip to Ashland. Um, so um, you can take a break, Mandy, from this portion of the program. Um, but I did want to update you on where we are on the corrective action plan. Um, 
and this is the same presentation. I will, I've already updated on the Backpack League. Um, so as we go into the corrective action plan areas, um, you can see that we have presented to you, if you'll flip up, there you go. We've presented to you from the bottom up, personnel management, early childhood, career and tech ed, and instructional management in our updates in the corrective action plan. Um, today we are going to update you um, on operations and IDEA um, and where we've come. You know a lot of this because I've updated you um, on these multiple times, but we did want to provide these to you. Um, so first of all, I uh, did want to give you an update of where we are on our each and every area of our corrective action plan. So you can see the total actions that we have to address in the corrective action plan. The, the yellow are developing, the green are established. You can see we're at 26% of our actions are established. Uh, much of the challenge that we talk about on a regular basis is when we feel we have the ability to change the yellow to green. Um, because many of them are ongoing things that we have to ensure that each and every month um, that they are happening and that they're happening across 156 schools. Um, and so we have an amount of time that we want to check and see that there are no errors um, on these as we move forward. Um, but you can see where we are on each of the 10 areas. The next slide gives you our progress in um, each of the areas month by month. So the first time we reported to you in December of 18 through April, you can see the growth um, in each of the areas. And we are happy to say that in December, we started at 13% established. Um, we've doubled that since that time. Currently, we're at 26% established. Um, we have until the fall of 2020 um, to make sure that we get 100% of these established. So I believe we are on pace at this point and are on track to get that, especially if we can grow at about 8% each time we uh, report to you. So um, our progress has been substantial in each of these areas. I can say this, that each and every week, a part of our cabinet meeting is to report on one or two areas of the cap, bring people in, talk about our progress and how we can move these um, from the developing to the established category. Um, as we move into operations, um, you know a lot of the operations. I mean, we've talked about facilities um, immensely. We've talked about infrastructure. Um, the other two areas that we are working on, uh, I won't belabor the points around facilities. I know I've hammered that home many times over the past several months and what we've done. Um, but. The, we have some audit recommend, recommendations um, around nutrition services. Um, we have some audit recommendations around bus routes, um, around safety and training of bus drivers and on bus routes. And then we have to develop a business continuity plan, um, which I believe at the end of this, we will have the most substantial continuity plan of any district. Um, or department anywhere in the state. So we are looking forward to that being a model of continuity plan. Um, so some of the outcome data, you know the new schools that we've approved. I wanted to highlight that. Um, but toward the bottom, couple bottom ones that we provided targeted behavior support strategies to staff, um, including 1,246 bus drivers. And then we've done 1,100 site visits conducted to monitor compliance with nutrition services requirements. Um, we will be bringing to you some recommendations in the near future around this corrective action um, around as centralization of nutrition services um, and how we can ensure that uh, that is meeting the corrective action plan. So that's our work around operations. We continue to work on that and improve that. We'll bring you back um, some further work and when we come back to it in six or eight months. Um, the next one is around IDEA, which we've talked about a lot. Um, and you know our challenges that we've talked about here, and I've had discussions with you around. Um, and I just wanted to highlight a few of those. First of all, around the ARC, that committee, the admission and release committee, being the driving force that makes decisions um, for uh, children, ECE children with IEPs. Um, it's a big challenge for us. 
um, because the art committees are the ones that can make that least restrictive environment placement for students or provide services for students. And we really have to make sure that we have the ability um, to, those ARCs are well trained um, and provide the best services for the child. And at central office, we are able um, to produce those services and provide them for our students. Um, clearly, compliance is a major issue for us when it comes to IDEA. Um, and I said last week, we have two levels that we have to work on when it comes to ECE. First level is compliance, making sure 156 sites and nearly 13,000 students that have IEPs in this district, we are in compliance with each and every one of those. That's no small lift, um, but we ha that's, that's our challenge and we have to make sure that that happens. Um, but then a deeper level where e every single special ed student receives the services and instruction they need to be successful um, in a least restrictive environment. So we are working to do that. Um, and then disproportionality and discipline. We have, um, that is what's gotten us in the IDEA cap, disproportionality and discipline. And we've had to work, uh, and we are working pretty extensively on that. Um, in the past couple weeks, all of our principals, well, our first round of principals, I should say, middle, high school, and all of our AIS principals have gone through extensive training on this work. Um, our cabinet was trained yesterday on the disproportionality and how we can improve that. We'll continue to train all of our ECE teachers, um, our assistant principals, our counselors, our new um, implementation coaches at every single school are a big part of this. Um, so this is tough, hard work, and quite candidly, this is the one of the 10 that is the biggest challenge and will take the most consistent work for us over the next 18 months because we do have to recreate how we've done things over several decades in JCPS. Um, and we're in that process, but we're going to have to continue that. So some of those strategies, you know, we continue these weekly meetings with KDE. We asked your funding for that ECE implementation coach for all schools. That professional development I've talked about, we're going to have a massive amount of professional development um, over the next several months. We do desk audits. Desk audits really entail um, taking a look at students' folders and IEPs to make sure that we are in compliance on a regular basis. And then really tear down the silos and collaborate with other departments like instruction to make sure that we're getting to that deeper level um, where instruction is provided for all of our ECE students. A few of the outcome data that we're working around right now. Um, next, next slide, there you go. So we had 1,260 desk audits conducted so far this year. 100% um, of our principals and assistant principals have this commitment. I stood in front of them, made that commitment to um, make sure that we have that for our principals and our assistant principals. And clearly our principals have to lead this work. No longer um, can it be that ECE is given to another department. Our principals have to be the lead in this work, and we've talked with them extensively about this. And then you can see some of our data that we think we're making positive steps towards. So 8% reduction in suspension incidents for ECE students, and then you can see a 7% increase in students meeting map reading growth benchmarks and 8% increase in meeting math growth benchmarks from the winter assessment. We'll have the spring assessment um, coming up. Um, so it, the one that um, we will have to focus on intensely for the next 18 months without question to continue the work is this work around our um, IDEA. Um, I feel positive about our um, new chief of ECE that we have hired, Kim Chevalier, who will be joining us the first week of May. Um, and we'll be leading this work on a regular basis to make sure that we transform and continue this transformation of ECE. But I'm confident that we will get there and be successful in both of these areas. Um, so at this point, I'll take any questions or comments you have about our progress. Ms. Duncan. Just had a question of, about the um, operational, under operations and thus the su suggestions and recommendations they made there. Uh, one was concerning monitors on long rides, which we know is not necessarily the need, but um, what are we doing with that particular effort right now to try and get 
our monitors on the buses where we need monitors. So if you recall, we've approved additional monitors on our buses um, several months ago. Um, and so that we could increase it. So that was a part of our corrective action plan. It is a challenge to hire bus monitors. That's not an easy work. Um, but you all did approve early on in the process additional bus monitors um, in order to fulfill that need. How, how many have we been able to add? Um, no. I don't know that number. I'll have to get you that exact number. I'd be happy to get you how many we've added and how many vacancies we have. Is there a turnover in monitors, a, a lot of turnover in that? We, have we noticed that? There's some. One thing that we do in addition is that schools, um, like when I was a principal, I had a bus monitor who worked in my, um, one of my classrooms. So she was one of my most effective bus monitors because she knew the kids. So we work closely with schools so they can get people that, that know the children on those buses too. And our transportation department has a system where they look at the, the um, routes that they're having challenges with. It changes, right? This, this week it could be this route, and three kids move, and now it's this other route. So it's an ongoing look at each route. And in their weekly meetings, um, either schools can bring up routes that they're worried about, or the transportation team can bring up routes. Often those two coincide. So they make decisions about where to put monitors based on the information they're getting both from their bus drivers and from the schools. Okay, do we have, do we feel that we have enough or are we still searching? The, um, I think that folks feel really supported by you all when you added those bus monitors. That has made a difference. We continue to look for more and we continue to ask schools to find more um, because we want to support kids on buses. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Board Member Craig. Just wondering if you might give us uh, your sense of the feedback from the Kentucky Board during your report while you were in Ashland. Was it positive? Do you have a good sense of the room while you were there? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, um, uh, from my perspective, which I can't say outside of the meeting or, you know, behind closed doors, but clearly I get some questions about what we're doing. Um, you know, but I feel that the feedback that I've gotten has been positive about the work that we've, we've um, been doing and, and where we're headed. Um, and, you know, it's interesting through this work, um, there are several areas where we have become the model of how to do this, um, where we are being asked in KDE in several areas to um, help train um, and bring out the model that we have built out of this statewide. Um, so I think we're getting positive feedback. I mean, I'm clear that when I do this that we still have work to do, um, that we're not there yet, but I, I, we're getting positive feedback about the progress we've made to this point. Mr. Brady. Um, one question about the one aspect of the corrective action plan that does apply directly to this board. Um, looking at the uh, very, be very beginning first page of the corrective action plan, uh, on the first line item that I guess directly affects us, it's A1, and it has a status uh, as this March 2019 progress. It says completed, but our our color indicator status still says yellow. I wasn't sure if that needed to be green. I believe we have a couple of trainings um, that are a part of that. I'll let them. I know they're looking at it right now, um, but our next board retreat. Mm -hmm. um, we have some trainings that are a part of our corrective action plan that we will be providing that we think at that point will turn it to green. Um, As I see completed, I think green. Yes. When we're um, getting ready to do the um, different methods of funding, and we're planning, scheduling that right now, so when that is done, we're going to kind of get a two for one because we're going to turn the funding one green and that one green since that's one of the roles and responsibilities of the board. Yeah, okay. and that always tries that always strikes me as being weird because you know we're by law required to take finance and a lot of us have already taken finance yes. several times and over the years and we're perfectly aware of our funding options but mm -hmm. okay fine uh, and you know and also the fact that that in this particular case wasn't really the point the point that they mentioned was that there's an interference in the day-to-day -day, but without actually giving a clear example as to what that actually is so we can solve the problem so it seems pretty nebulistic at best um, and I was just kind of curious to know there is an A2 part of this, um, and it does say is, it does say receive KSB a reflection tool for boards and is attached. But I wasn't sure when 
we were going to be um, having to go through that particular training or just reflection tool that apparently has been provided to the district. So we, um, we reached out and got that tool. What we were going to do is see if you guys were interested in that. It is a self-reflection tool that um, you all could choose to use or not to use. So we'll be bringing that to you all to see which direction you want to go with that. We are exploring also at our next retreat the option that we can bring to you all um, of looking at Council of the Great City Schools to provide us some um, training or work together. And, and I would really call it more, I think training connotates a, a, a different thing than team building mm -hmm. um, and some work that might be, maybe other large districts around the United States do. Um, so we're looking at that as a possibility. We've got to see if we can get them to come in and do some work. But we want it to be meaningful, obviously, and not just a, a compliant activity. And just out of curiosity, and, and I don't expect you to have a full answer on this, but I'm just going to throw this question out there. Are we aware of any other districts, whether large districts like us or even within the state of Kentucky, that have the probably number of retreats that this board does to do specifically for, build, uh, for team building? Not I'm, that I'm, I'm aware, aware of, of none. None. Not that I'm aware of. Yeah, me either. So just kind of curious about I that. I mean, there could be. I just, I'm not aware of them. Yeah, I'm not aware of that either. And I talk to people all the time. So, all right. Thank you. Um, also, I think it's important to say that we are the largest district in the state of Kentucky and we are, we're special. So uh, we, we build. If we weren't, our, we wouldn't be dealing with this. Well, whatever, but we're special. And when we're special, we have to go above and beyond. And that's why we're reaching out to the Council of Great City Schools to bring us the dynamics of large urban school districts to come in and, and work with us. Um, any board that I have ever served on, there's always an opportunity to come in. It's kind of more than a get to know you session. So I think that that's one of the things that we're trying to work with every time we have a newly elected board. How can we bring people in other than just the uh, standard board orientation, which is showing you the forms, the formats, the time to show up and those kinds of things. So we're trying to uh, develop something that's a little bit broader with by doing that and working with the Council of Great City Schools and trying to get it at a time when we can get everyone together. So it's a, a work in progress. And thank you, uh, Amy. Thank you, Dr. Dossett, for reaching out to the Council of Great City Schools. When we know more, we'll share more. Other questions or comments? Ms. Duncan. You know, I had asked about that, and I tried to look at the attachment to get to whatever the explanation was for the specifics about what we have done to be called interfering in day-to-day -day operations. Because if we don't know that, it's it's not helpful for us to be able to fix. If we if we've done that, we need to know exactly how that happened. And I don't think any of us know the specifics about that. And I, I did not find it on page 30 in that attachment. I couldn't get the attachment eight to open. So uh, I would appreciate, you know, being somehow rather having access to, to what we supposedly have done wrong. So I think we can get, the only thing we can give you is what's in that report. I mean, that was from the spring of 2017. Um, so, uh, I mean, we, we can give you, a, what's in that report that's all we know at this time okay or at any time i think that uh we are an exceptional board and i think we show the community that by coming together and doing our work it's easy again to criticize from afar and if there are specifics and they want to give those to us right but uh in the years that i have been on the board there is always conversation about we're out of our lane whatever our lane is we're out of it so i think that that's what they did by, by putting that in in that document. Um, that's why sometimes I try to shape things about why we have an opportunity to ask questions because we are in charge of funding and resources and those kinds of things and programs. So I think if we guide our work with uh, why we are here, it's more than writing policies. It's taking care of children, making sure their access and opportunity is available. So. It's easy to say that we're not in our lane, but our lane is our children in Jefferson County Public Schools. We are not in the schools. I haven't seen any of us teach a class. 
but we are in the schools, so we are aware of what's going on in the schools. Can we be better? Every board can be better, not just public education boards. Every board can work to be better. So what we're trying to do is develop a, a record of what we have done and the training that we have taken above and beyond what we are required to take by the Kentucky State Board of Education, I have a State Board Association that's offered to us. And um, if they tell us the specifics, okay. If not, we still are the best board. We are seven members and we're working real hard for Jefferson County. That's my personal opinion, one of seven. Other comments? Dr. Chris. Um, on the developing completed yellow green, um, does KDE sign off on that when we move something from to green? Um, who like uh, you know they're they're not going to come back and say you know in six months well wait a minute all these ones you turn green actually are green. Um, we asked for continual feedback as part of the settlement agreement and that seems like a suitable area for them to give us feedback. So, so every month every other month um, a KDE team comes and they meet with the JCPS team and we review item by item. We look at the evidence of progress for each of those actions and have discussions about next steps and um, follow up on those particular actions. So we are getting feedback every other month that team comes um, to JCPS and we go through item by item. The other months, um, uh, Ms. Dennis, myself and Dr. Polio go to KDE and we meet with Ke uh, Dr. Kelly Foster and Dr. Wayne Lewis to have um, kind of a broader conversation around our progress. And so we are getting feedback on a monthly basis from KDE around our progress. Is that noted in any like minutes or anything like that that you know we can point to? Yes, um, we take careful minutes when they are here to, so that we make sure to follow up on everything that they ask us to do. Okay. Those are our notes though. Yeah, yeah correct. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. So the green and to my understanding, I mean that's our progress. Mm -hmm. So when we feel that we have done it, um, and, and we have, I mean I'm not gonna say it's just our decision. We have collaborative discussions with KDE staff, um, that, and I think that's what it is, is collaborative. But when we feel that we can move something to a green, we do. Now, according to this, what it will really come down to is where we are in October of 2020 mm -hmm. when in each of these areas. Right. Um, so that is front and center, that even if we move it to green and somewhere along the line it is not effective We've got to keep that in mind too, that um, because all of these actions have to be fully implemented um, and provided oversight and ensure that it's happening in every location. Other questions or comments? Um, Dr. Polio, do you want to close it out for us? Um, so that's that's our presentation. Obviously, we'll come back to you um, in a couple of months as we um, will update on the next portion of our cap. Um, I believe looking at it in um, the next couple meetings, we will be through all of them, um, all 10 of our areas, and then we will begin to circle back and tell you how we're progressing at each one from there. So that concludes it. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation this evening. Look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you very much. Our next item, the next information item, has to do with the alternative school planning and implementation, phase one. Dr. Polio. Uh, thank you, Chair Porter and board members. Um, so you know we've talked about um, our alternative schools um, over um, many months now and the plan that um, we've been working on. Um, clearly, we had a lot of hurdles um, as we move forward on um, the alternative school planning, and we want you um, and the community to feel comfortable with how we are moving forward. Um, I think it's important to note that I continue to say we are going to have to do things differently um, with our alternative schools. Um, we cannot be happy or satisfied with outcomes that we have at this point. Um, but in order to move forward effectively, we've def decided to go forward in two phases. The first phase will be for the 1920 school year, where we will change um, some of the supports that we give to our alternative school students, some of the experiences we give to our t alternative school students, and we will continue 
um, as we move into the fall looking at phase two to bring back to you a more substantial option um, so that we can move forward with major change to our alternative schools. Um, so I'm going to turn it over um, to our team led by Dr. Coleman and Dr. Horton who will walk through a little bit about what our plan is phase one and then we'll briefly touch on some phase two. So just to give you a, um, just kind of a reminder about where we've been. So we started um, meeting with the Alternative School Task Force about last May, about a year ago, right? Yep. Um, Dr. D. Ferrari and her team facilitated that work. We had many um, multiple meetings that were very, very well attended, um, very well organized. Um, that those meetings resulted in a set of recommendations that, as Dr. Polio said, we, we feel that we need to approach those kind of in a phased way. Um, so Dr. DeFerrari is going to talk about what, what is being recommended for phase one. It's also important, um, as, as I want to publicly recognize her and the work of her team, um, also Dr. Beatty, um, Christy Rogers, Dr. Smith, we're all um, key in this process, and so we've really um, collaborated to create a plan that, that we are really excited about. So, Dr. D. Farrar. Okay, thanks. Good evening. Uh, do you have the clicker? Yeah. Great. Will you click it? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you've seen these four focus areas before, and some of these items you're going to know because you've heard them before. Uh, in other presentations we've given you about progress in this process. Uh, we looked at four major areas and had work teams at each meeting that focused on uh, these different um, kind of buckets. First, we had the safe and productive learning environment. Uh, we talked greatly about curriculum instruction for these students, uh, support for behavior and interventions, and then finally, how are we going to handle wraparound supports and transition for these students? If you look at the intake process and communications, that was one area the task force spent quite a bit of time, and I think we're really excited about what we think we can do for 1920. Um, first, uh, we've interacted a lot with our partners that were on the task force and even some that were not about best practices with onboarding students and orienting students uh, when they transition in, making sure that we not just look at academic needs, we also look at interest with post-secondary and career, and we also obviously look at um, social emotional needs and things that have to do with other types of wraparound supports uh, on the more therapeutic side of things. Uh, we did emphasize as a task force that we felt mental health professionals needed to be the primary doers of that work and so in the recommendations we're, we're um, going to be making those types of folks will be doing that work. Um, also we want to be able to do some individualized planning while parents are there for that process. We really want to make them feel like they are part of the process. Uh, that they understand what their students are going to be doing um, and how their programming and supports are going to look through that and if the parent needs to be a partner which certainly they will be um, how are, how's that going to work and how are they going to connect if you look at the second component we're talking about engagement um, dr coleman's going to talk in a minute about, about big picture which we've discussed with you but we really want to make sure that the learning is personalized that so many of those students are at a different place um, they're at different speeds, they're at different learning levels, and so making sure that they can be guiding and engaged in their own learning. Uh, and there are lots of frameworks to help us do that, and we believe that we can help teachers uh, be trained to implement that with, with good fidelity. We also want to make sure that students have access to electives. That's something that the students said they wanted. It's something that we know best practice would say they should have. Uh, and we've already actually polled the students um, at both schools around their interests. Um, not just with general electives, but also with CTE areas. Uh, and so we're excited about that because those fit beautifully with a lot of the CTE opportunities and pathways we already have. Uh, and so as you can see in the last component, Doc, um, Christy has been such a partner in thinking about how can we do um, maybe shorter term programming, programming they can continue when they go back to their schools. How might we even be able to take some of these students um, to some of our other schools for opportunities and hands-on learning experiences and also what are some other things they might be able to do at some of our business partners or with our business partners to stay engaged um, and then clearly there is no question that we've got to deal with equity cultural responsive teaching uh, culturally responsive practices in general at the schools 
um, and professional development for staff, not just around instructional pieces, but also bias reduction, also restorative practices. You have a professional development list um, that were recommended from the task force. That's something we've given to you already. Um, and so you're welcome to review that. Nothing about that has changed. Uh, mental health and behavioral supports. We've talked about this as a partnership. Not only do we want to see mental health professionals help with the transitions in, the transitions to re-engage them with their schools when they're finished, but we also feel like the mental health professionals also need to really work side by side with any kind of behavior support staff around modeling expectations, modeling de-escalation, and being a partner on that team. Uh, we feel like that's impactful, and that was an amazing recommendation made by stakeholders on the task force. Certainly, these are not all our, all our brain children, but we had expertise from folks that work in all different capacities in our community around students, especially students like our kids that are attending these schools. And so they felt that it's been advantageous for them in other settings to really have that mental health professional with a security team, potentially, responding to classrooms and helping in situations where kids are escalated. Uh, we've talked at length about PBIS and restorative practices. That's important at every school uh, and especially at these schools. And we have extensive opportunities to train staff. Um, I, let's see, you know most of these. One component that the team was very committed to was youth empowerment slash self-advocacy training. Uh, we do have um, several individuals we've talked to and we have some choice in that that we clearly want to involve the school leadership and people that work at the schools in choosing. But we have some great programs to choose from um, that we feel are affordable and accessible to the students and staff. I'm also very excited about the re-engagement process. Um, this is really not going to be part of the requests for funding that are going to be coming from um, the other requests because we're going to be embedding this really with some other programming out of culture and climate, but being able to have district level staff that will case manage every student transitioning from the detention center or from one of our behavior support alternative schools back to their schools and ensure that we have consistent application of a case management protocol. Every student gets at least that service and those conversations happen for every student around their transition needs. And those folks will also be holding a meeting prior to the transition meeting with staff at the receiving school to make sure that anything that needs to get resolved or discussed about that student returning, they can share concerns, they can put some things on their radar, and we can really try to make sure we have a healthy transition. Because we know if we don't have students that are recidivists, we're obviously getting where we want to go. We want students to effectively transition back and be successful. Um, and then finally, there is quite a bit of work with Big Picture around individual learning plans. So we're excited about the possibility of partnering with Big Picture Learning. I shared some information, or we shared some information about them in our first presentation. They are um, a, a, a school model that has been found to be really successful with students who, for whatever reason, haven't been as successful in the traditional setting. Um, we visited, uh, we have visited big picture schools and there's actually one in Shelby County here. We got to go there. Um, we, Dr. Ferrari actually um, had a conference in California and made a, a, a detour to see a big picture school there. We had a team go down to the big picture school in Nashville and, and everyone has come away feeling just so excited about what they saw. Their model is based on um, being very personalized with students. Um, all students complete multiple internships, um, and those internships are very much a part of the students' learning, um, the way that they learn the standards, the way, it's just a, it's, it's a this is just a really, really good, good opportunity for us. Um, they are they very much involve the parents and families in what they do and so um, the next step for that is, is uh, one that we're excited about they will come and do what's called a school success study um, we'll be asking you to approve that contract um, and what they do is just go into the schools and talk with staff talk with students talk with parents community members and then kind of give us a sense of What's, what schools might be ready for a full implementation of this model? We have also brought Liberty and TAP into this discussion. 
Um, we, we think this could be a, a major, major win for both of those, both of those schools. And then also, of course, uh, Minor Daniels and Breckenridge Metro um, have been part of these discussions. And it may be that there are, certainly there are aspects of big picture, if not the majority of their programming that we can use there as well. So we're excited for the impact this could have on those schools, but we're also excited about what we can learn um, that is really getting at what we want for all of our students. And, and I would just like to say, uh, none of this is possible without the work uh, with Dr. DeFerrari and um, Dr. Coleman, but the school principals uh, under the leadership of Dr. Beatty, I feel, I feel like we have really began to we've stabilize leadership uh, they are not just there to uh, manage the building. Uh, they are there actually working with students with social emotional supports, uh, academics as, as seen with the last round for MAP for, for Breck Metro. So we're excited that the leadership there is, is starting to shape form, and we believe that those, are, those two individuals are, are, are strong in their leadership of those campuses. All right, so facilities. You want to go on and talk about uh, what that would mean. Yep. So, of course, um, Minor Daniels and Brett Metro will remain in their current locations for this upcoming school year. Um, and we are, we've pretty much been pretty uh, we're solid in our decision with that. All right. So, so where we are. So, um, you know, phase two will be that we want to continue, obviously, to review the recommendations of the task force and to consider those as we as we continue to move forward with this um, we'll monitor this first phase of implementation and make adjustments as needed and then determine next steps for 2021 questions questions miss duncan I'm sorry to always be ready for a question I know I hope anybody else wants to go first you certainly can I just I'll just sit and wait there a minute but um, I'm not feeling where we're going to get more space for our middle school students because that seems to be one of our biggest challenges here so we're going to keep everything the same and what does that do to our middle schools if we keep everything the same so we're going to bring to you, there are currently some policies around um, the, um, what students go to which school. We're going to bring to you some potential changes for that so that um, we have the ability for some um, seats specifically with ECE if ARCs determine that, um, that we would then have room in uh, middle and high school for some, some additional spots. At Minor Daniel, is that what you're talking about? It could be both. Okay. Um, I forgot the other question. I'll come back. Board Member Goose. So is it still our plan to keep separate alternative middle school students from alternative high school students? It is uh, our long-term goal, yes. Um, clearly, we couldn't get to that in phase one. Um, but it is definitely a part of the work that we will be looking towards to do in phase two. When would you imagine um, phase, uh, it says 20 through 21, is that uh, the time frame for phase yeah, two? Yeah, we're going to bring something earlier to you next year. So um, we did work it through this entire school year. I mean, our first discussion of this was late summer mm -hmm. last year um, and a lot of discussion, but we were not at a point that I think we felt uh, the board felt comfortable um, with that whole plan. Um, so I think you will see something in the fall um, that is going to be a plan of how we would move forward for the following school year. Okay. And so this is part of my um, concern with how we're operating the alternative structure with um, locations that house both middle school students and high school students who are, are in the alternative school program. So at your earliest, you have a middle schooler who has exited fifth grade at 11 years old. Um, at the latest, you have an alternative school senior who may be 17 or 18 years old. Mm -hmm. And so I see it as an issue of equity, an issue of inequality, really. If we have 
a common expectation that if you are in a regular education environment, you are with students of your own age group in a middle school, um, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, anywhere from age 11 to potentially age 14, whereas in high school, we have them from age 15 to 18. If there is a very clear reason in JCPS why we choose to keep our regular education students separated in terms of elementary, middle, and high, I don't see how really we get away with lumping our alternative school students all into one setting. When we have perhaps our most troubled 11-year-old in the same building with our most troubled 18-year-old. Um, to me, I view that as a recipe for disaster. I mean, that, that is our goal, is to separate them. We've, we've clearly stated that, um, mm -hmm. and we're going to work to, towards getting there. Right, and I appreciate that very much. Um, the, the other comment that I had about the alternative school system um, in general is that I think it's important to, to remember that for some students, an alternative school program is truly what's in the best interest of that child. Um, I think that oftentimes you hear alternative school and your gut reaction is to associate a negative connotation with that. However, alternative schools exist in order to provide an alternative for students who are not successful in a regular education environment. Um, so when the community hears alternative school, they probably have a particular schema in their mind, a connotation. That's not the point of an alternative school. An alternative school is not a punishment. An alternative school is an alternative for students to learn in a better environment. I would just, I just we wanted agree. to make that point. We agree. We agree. Board Member Shul. Thank you. I just want to compliment you on um, what I, I see as a much more progressive and uh, robust plan for doing alternative, um, for shaping our alternative schools. And so I really want to compliment you on this very important, what I see as very important work. Um, I would like to see you all um, add more emphasis on the intake process. Most students who, you're right, Mr. Geese, um, so many times alternative environments are what's best, in the best interest of the child, but they don't see it that way going in. And so uh, work needs to be done around, um, I, I don't know, helping them to embrace the environment. And I do think uh, many of the therapeutic helps that you have and uh, the engagement processes and so forth will help them uh, with this process. But I would like you all to add something in that intake process that helps relieve students of the anxiety of going into an alternative uh, environment, uh, help reduce the, the sheer anger at being uh, recommended to go to an alternative environment so that the process of um, uh, the, the, the restorative process can begin more immediately. But again, thank you uh, for, for this very, very important work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, board Member Craig, then Board Member Brady. Just I uh, want to echo the same comments. Thank you guys for everything that you're doing. Uh, and I'm much more comfortable with this approach and I appreciate uh, your bringing it to us um, in this phased approach tonight. And I'll echo what you said, uh, Dr. Horton, about the leadership in each of those two buildings. I had about three hours at Minor Daniels with uh, the new principal, Mr. Oh, or Dr. Dr. Little. Little. Yeah. And I uh, had an hour with the new principal at Breck Metro last week. And I'm impressed with both of them. And I'm starting to feel much more comfortable about what we're doing in both those buildings now. So thank you all. Thank you. Um, so, a couple things. Uh, I know the uh, board member Gee said mentioned that we keep our grades separate. Uh, I will just want to mention that we do have two schools: Brown School, which has multiple grades from elementary all the way through 12, and Phoenix School of Discovery, which has middle and high school. So it isn't that Minor Daniels isn't the only one that has multiple. Uh, Shawnee as well. And Shawnee as well. Thank and you. More. Um, and more. But more has different buildings. Mm -hmm. So, but the, uh, I just want to say there's other examples out there. But that said, for this particular type of school for Minor Daniels, uh, I think it's important to have a little bit of context behind this. And some of this has happened before some of you have gotten here. Um, but in 2015, uh, the former chief academic officer of this district had, uh, or one of the former chief academic officers, um, had brought a plan for success pathways before this board 
Uh, part of that plan was, uh, it was a facilities issue because we had run out of seats in one of our clusters, so we took what was um, Kennedy Metro Middle and turned that into Kennedy, uh, Alex Kennedy Elementary School, which is what it originally was way back when, and we created Minor Daniels, uh, which had, which mixed the uh, middle school students with high school students. Um, at that time, we asked the uh, administrator, did they have enough, uh, everything they needed to move forward with it? Unequivocally, the answer was yes. By the fall of that year, things had blown up, and we were having concerns from multiple uh, teachers in the multiple schools that not only were we having incidences where we would have discipline issues, fairly serious discipline issues with students that would normally would automatically go to an alternative school, like hitting a teacher, but because there was no more room over at Minor Daniels, because we had uh, combined these schools, that that student would have to stay in the class, many times coming back the very next day, until there was room. And to my knowledge, that still hasn't really relieved itself because we still haven't created any more room or capacity within the system. Um, so I just want to throw that out there and the fact that there is a little bit of, and to just give context behind the process of how we got to this point. Um, I'm a little confused and dismayed because a few weeks ago, because the comment about the facilities where we're okay with this, I'm confused because the administration had come to us saying that with some of these programs that these students really do need, especially to try and to be in compliance of IDEA, and a few weeks back, actually a couple months ago, we received a 23-page report talking about some deficiencies within our district of how we need to address those items. But now, because we were, we were told of the original facilities plan that was presented to us a few weeks ago, that the reason Liberty was chosen for Minor Daniels is that it had extra room to be able to accommodate these programs. If there's no more room to accommodate these programs in the current facilities that they're in, so now we're talking about doing a phased approach, but yet we just had a conversation about the corrective action plan that gives us a deadline of 2020 to be able to address some of these IDA issues. I don't see how these things are gonna be resolved. I see there being a conflict of how this is going to be fixed as part of that corrective action plan. So I understand you're doing, you're making do with what you've got, right? I, I understand that aspect of it, but I do have serious concerns about this program, and I had serious concerns before, but there were mitigating issues that were that we can go into later on offline that prompted that decision for the board to go that route with the success pathways, because the status quo certainly wasn't working and there's some serious changes needed to happen, but I'm still equally concerned about going forward with this because these are at-risk students. They need extra supports. They are, you know, they need extra funding. Uh, you know, I, not to be too flip, but you know, if a good student is pretty cheap to educate, it's the students that need extra supports or the ones that we actually really need to be spending more money and more funds on to make sure that we're trying to make up the gap for this. So I have serious concerns about going forward with this, but at the same time though, I know that without another facility, I, 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 you're making do with what you have. I just, trying to help me find a resolution of this where we're, we're not taken over by the state because we failed to issue it to fix this issue, where, I mean, it just, this doesn't seem to fix this. Well, I think we're gonna have to do things differently. So, I mean, you're, uh, clearly um, speaking to someone who is intimately aware of the challenges that we have that deal with it day after day after day um, and all the corrective action plan as well as everyone on this team. I mean, so that is not escaping us whatsoever. Um, we are going to bring to you, we're going to have to make some changes to um, the assignment of kids to, to certain schools. Um, we're going to have to look at some alternative um, ways that we are going to ask you for students um, who are essentially aging out. So the um, traditional way we have done it is we assign kids to an alternative school. Um, they could be 17, 18 years old with credits that are not going to put them on a pathway towards graduation. We are going to have to look at some alternative ways that, um, and the, not just at um, Breck Metro and Minor Daniels, but I think we're looking at um, you know, other students, too, that we think that, that we could provide um, Jefferson County High School or some online experiences that, that we could 
provide them a much quicker path towards graduation instead of having them just sit in six classes every single day hoping that they're going to graduate three years away from now. So there's no doubt that we're not just moving forward and saying we're keeping it exactly the same. We are going to bring back some different changes we have around assignment and additional programs that we'll be providing for kids so that we have additional ways to serve students in ECE. Okay, when? Because we're under a deadline. Uh, so when will that you, one, I, I know I'm throwing, a, I'm asking you for a date that you're probably not prepared to answer, but you know. Prior to the new school year. This coming prior, mm -hmm. so sometime this Correct. summer. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Board Member Goose. I do just have a small comment. Um, in, re in regards to the timeline, I do um, I do think the timeline is is one of a sense of urgency when it comes to alternative school program programming, and I understand what we're doing in order to enhance that, and I'm appreciative of that. I'm appreciative of the work that you are doing. However, I can personally attest that in the, the three interviews that I've had as a board member with members of the Kentucky Department of Education, the number of seats, or rather the lack of the number of seats that we provide in our alternative school programs has come up every time um, from Kelly Foster herself. Um, so that is a critical issue that I think we must work to address. We certainly agree. Other comments? First of all, thank you for making your presentation this evening. There's much work to be done. Thank you, Dr. Polio, for trying to um, make things fit. Um, a couple of things I'd like to say. I think that there has been some um, more work on presenting us something that's focused on students as opposed to uh, just putting something out there saying we've got this plan and we've got to make it work for students. One of the things that I am personally bothered by is when we start talking about alternative schools for, for kids that are always in trouble. Alternative schools should be for kids for learning. Mm -hmm. And we have to identify what their learning deficits are and what their emotional and behavior deficits are. And I, I'm always very concerned. I have, I'm asking the question about these mental health specialists how we're uh, allocating those to the schools. All students that are not in a regular school are not bad students. We have to understand the population that we serve, but as long as every time somebody misbehaves, it's put them in a special school because they are bad students. Every student has the ability to do good work. It's how you approach that student with that good work. So I just have to say that because although we're saying alternative, I was at a conference in Philadelphia and met a gentleman who came to Louisville, Kentucky to visit this district. At that time, it was a city school district. And the alternative school he visited was the Brown School. Mm -hmm. That's right. The Brown School. <laughs> the alternative school that he visited was the Brown School. So I wish that we, as we make our, as we talk about students, let's talk about meeting them where they are, or better yet, how did they get there? What's wrong today? What can we do to help? We know we have a lot of work to do. I just looked up some of the big picture parts. There are some things that students can do. It's not all career and tech ed. It, it could be technical, it could be a lot of things, but it, it's concerning to me. We all have had children or no children, so when we start labeling students, that, that's problematic for me personally. And I think that we need to figure a better way to talk about, I mean, we can call it an alternative to school, we could call it alternative learning. There are lots of things we could call it that do not have a negative con connotation that concerns me. And I think we need to, as a district, be better than that. And yes, we have a lot to figure out, um, the identification, I've talked about the mental health therapists, the behavior specialists, how we, if we identify children earlier, the potential to have less problems later exist. I think there's some research that says that somewhere along the line and there's more than one study that speaks to that. Students need to have options and I think that's what you're bringing to us tonight are options. I think what the board is saying is we appreciate the work that you've done. We would like to see a specific timeline and cost factor and how we're gonna make this work. One of the uh, questions that I have about 
how students will get to wherever they are assigned. Sometimes we find when we mix populations on the buses that creates uh, problems for our students. So I think that that's something that needs to be discussed in the overall uh, presentation that comes to us, not for tonight, but it's a question that some of us are asked as, so, as it pertains to behavior on the buses. And again, I just wish that we would approach this in meeting our students with their individual differences and coming up to instructional programs and behavior programs that make them work and stop assuming that every time we put a student in a special school that they are not the, the right student. They are our students, all of them. They are our responsibility. And I'm gonna get off my box now, but it, is, it just disturbs me a lot when we start talking about those students and where they need to be in some kind of place like, you know, we are not creating the pipeline of the prison in the Jefferson County Public Schools. We will not do that. We will receive our students and we will provide them the services that they need. That's just my personal opinion, one of seven, but it's important for me to say that because our job is to educate who we have. We don't pick, this is public education. Um, are there any other questions or comments? Dr. Polio, thank you. Thank you for everyone has presented this evening. It's information. We know that there's more to come. Thank you very much. So I think what I have neglected to do each time is to mo a motion to receive the information. So I'd like to go back to the uh, final corrective action plan. And that would be item A, is there a motion to receive the progress report on the JCPS final corrective action plan? Board member Craig, seconded by, nobody? Uh, Dr. Chris, seconded, all those in favor? Motion carries unanimously. The second item that we received information was for the alternative school planning and implementation. Phase one, is there a motion to receive the planning and implement? Implementation for phase one, board member Duncan, seconded by board member Shule. All those in favor, motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Moving on to the consent calendar, there are a number of items that have been pulled down. So I would like to read the items that have been pulled down and then ask for a motion to accept, uh, accept the consent calendar minus those items that have been pulled down. Chair Porter, I have an additional one, item R1. Okay, the items that are going to be pulled down, and there are multiple ones, the items to be pulled down are, uh, items to be pulled down are item K, item S, item Z, item M, item U, item S, item Z, I think I've already said M, um, item U, and now you said R1, is that correct? Yes, and I had a question as well. So the questions, of, is it about the consent calendar yes, that we're gonna it vote is. on? Okay. Um, item R2, the recommend, recommendation for approval of agreement with Western Kentucky University's March is withdrawn, is that correct? That's correct, it's been pulled from the agenda tonight. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay. Other questions before? Is there a motion to accept the consent calendar minus the items that I have named? Motion by board member Craig, seconded by Dr. Chris. All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. So we will go back and we will start pulling items down for um, explanation. I would like to do this alphabetically, but that might mess that up, so I'll apologize before I get started. It looks like the first item that we need to bring down for discussion is item uh, K. Item K is the recommendation for approval of construction change orders. Um, Mr. Brady, was that yours? Yes, Madam uh, Chairperson. Um, 
I have a concern about this. I've expressed some concerns about our construction change orders in the past with administration. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we have uh, two change orders that are talking about requesting that uh, paving of par parking lots um, that together these two changes basically uh, equal over a quarter million dollars of, uh, of additional changes. Uh, the administration is given, and these are, uh, items are owner requested, I might add. Um, the administration is given the explanation that we need to have a 5% uh, 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 contingency fee for any budgeted items, uh, but I am concerned that these items really should have been involved or at least been a part of the original proposal. Um, and in this particular case, uh, one of these schools that the administration has mentioned as an example uh, talks about that the issues within the contingency fee area, but yet the actual uh, full budget, as I read it on the, uh, uh, the agenda calendar, uh, or the consent agenda calendar, uh, actually listed as, the, uh, as being over budget right now. So uh, my concern is that, one, it seems like these are backdoor ways to have items added on there. Two, they uh, should be a part of the original proposal. Uh, if they were a part of the original proposal, we might be able to get a better deal on it or get other bidders that might have expertise in that area. And uh, three, I have a concern about these items. Uh, the, at least that the board, in addition to uh, really approving a budget item, let's just say for a million dollars, is what we're really uh, uh, adding or approving is a million dollars and 5%. So um, this is a concern I have, and I would, um, I'm curious to hear if anybody wants to address this, but those are my concerns. I'd, I'd be happy to address it. And we're required by KDE to set aside a 5% contingency fund on the contract price. So that is the bidded price that we've accepted of a renovation project or a construction project. So if a construction project was bid and it was bid in at a hundred dollars we'd have to set five dollars aside if we included these projects that we do and let me let me preface that as the project is getting near completion we're able to estimate the total cost of the project so with any construction pro with any construction project there's going to be some things that were unexpected. That's why you have the contingency fund. But of that $105 we've now set aside, let's say that only 102 were spent. At that point, KDE allows the district to spend the three additional dollars in our fictional $105 now that we've set aside on other things that that campus needs. So, however, if we included those up front, now, the bid price would be $105. And now we would have to set aside $5 and, I should have made it easier. <laughs> Off the top of my head, $5 and uh, 10 cents. 25 something money, <laughs> lots. Anyway, uh, if we were to include those in there, we would eat away at our bonding capacity. We can't, we can't add those things on because if we do, then we have to set aside more money. And given the vast number of projects we do over a summer, we would probably do one less project a summer if we had to set aside that additional contingency money. Uh, my concern with that is twofold. One, uh, paving a parking lot is not something that's unexpected. It's something we can easily see that, you know, probably can be done. It isn't like we got into a school and found out that a load-bearing wall needs to be removed and therefore we have to, or that the load, or whatever remodeling we're doing is, is going to exceed a load-bearing wall and we need to augment that. To me, paving a parking lot was not an unexpected thing. It's something that no, no, it's that. it's not unexpected at all. So, but and the the other concern I have is that currently we're at one hundred and ten or one hundred and ten dollars, even though our original contract was for a hundred. The the original contract. When you see the contract price, that's the contract that we have with a vendor, EH Construction, for example. 
as a vendor and they have a contract for $100. That means we're going to pay them $100. That's not the total project cost. That's just the total contract price. So whatever the vendor bids and we accept, we have to set aside 5% of capital funds at that point. We have a list of additional things, like I said, that we know about. Nothing that's a surprise. Sometimes it is security enhancements. Sometimes it is paving of the parking lot or renovation of a couple more rooms or um, any myriad of things that if we have money set aside at the end that we put that money toward in that building. Okay. I just, I just think there's just some things in here that are big enough that needs to be a part of the original contract. Well, we, we also know in, in some projects that there's going to be, we know that the contingencies money that is there. And if you, if you look at our projects and you go back and look through at these documents, this happens pretty often. So we know that we're going to be able to get to them with that 5%. So that was money that was set aside for that school and we start spending it on that school. It, it, given the financial situation that we are in with capital funding, this is a very wise way to do it. But if we threw everything in the kitchen sink in, we would still have 5% of our capital funds of that large amount now set aside that we couldn't use in anywhere else. We'd be happy to review the process and, and come back to you with a review of it. Um, Over the years, I've asked it. for such a review and I've yet to see one. Okay, well, we can do that for you. Yeah. Okay, that takes care of item K. Moving on to item you want to vote on? Shall we vote yeah, on as we go? Because there are quite a few tonight. Normally we have two or three. Is there a motion to uh, uh, approve the recommendation for the approval of construction change orders? Is there a motion? Board Member Geese, seconded by Board Member Craig. All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Thank uh, you. Nope. I'm sorry. I didn't raise All those hand. in favor? All those opposed? All those abstaining? All those in favor were six, no, and zero for no, and one abstention. Thank you. Moving on to item M. Recommendation for approval of professional services contracts, 5,000 or more. That item was pulled down by board member Duncan. Ms. Duncan? I'm fine with that. We had an explanation a while ago. Thank you. So you're okay? Yes. Is there a motion to approve item M, recommendation for approval of professional services contract, $5,000 or more? A motion. Board member Duncan, seconded by board member Craig. All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to R1, recommendation for approval of memorandum of agreement with the University of Kentucky <coughs> College of Education to implement online civics assessment. That was pulled down by board member Geese. Yes, thank you all for coming to give me a, a, a bit more information. Um, so I just want to make sure that I'm understanding the agreement correctly. So the agreement is with the University of Kentucky for the administration of the test. So I'm assuming some sort of online program that our district will be using in order to fulfill that state uh, long graduation requirement. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, could you give me a bit more information um, about the program itself and its implementation? So um, this is a program that is run out of the um, University of Kentucky. Several other districts throughout the state have used that this program this year. We, if approved by the board, are going to pilot it in one or two um, classrooms the remainder of this year so that we have a um, full implementation for next year moving forward. So it's an online assessment. Um, it's a 100 item civics test um, mm -hmm. to meet the requirement for graduation and they have to um, have a passing score. Right. And so it allows, it allows for, um, teachers to um, be able to, if, if students don't pass it the first time, um, kind of chunk it out so that they can provide extra support to students. Okay, so I suppose my, real, my main question is, 
is this simply a mechanism that will be used to record then who passes or not, or is this is a is this being used by teachers in the classroom as a practice tool, um, sort of preliminary to see where students are, engage how they'll perform on the actual graduation requirement assessment? Right. Yeah, I think it's the it's the it's the latter there, uh, with about six thousand seniors that we are graduating and, and ensuring that every student. Uh, uh, passes that test and has multiple opportunities to do so mm -hmm. this platform and, and will enable us uh, to administer that assessment and be able to to track and to uh, make sure that students uh, um, record is posted that they've completed that assessment because right now the process is internal and it, and it requires a, a little more manual uh, uh, administration of that and, and with that volume of students particularly with uh, uh, as, as year progresses, we were looking to pilot mm -hmm. uh, a, a solution that would make it a little bit easier on schools to manage that graduation mm -hmm. requirement. Right. So primarily, and correct me if I'm wrong, primarily this is a practice tool that teachers will be able to use to see what students are getting wrong and how they can better teach them on those core subjects. Is there an, an analysis tool or is it simply take it, you get six out of ten correct, you got ten out of ten correct, and... Um, that's where we stand or is there any is there any deeper analysis to it or is it simply an online practice test this is an online test practice test they it's a test that they can take multiple times right to pass it and get a 60 percent pass rate so um once we if, if board approves it we and we pilot it in a few schools we'd be happy to bring back more information about mm -hmm. the teachers experiences and whether they <clears throat> thought it was helpful for their students as um, Dr. Beatty mentioned we um, wanted to pilot this program because it does allow a little bit less burden on teachers so right now um, there's um, they, they use a bubble sheet where they mm -hmm. um, students take a take the test they have to scan it and then um, the scan sheet has to be quality checked and then post it. And so there's quite a bit of lag time between when a student might take the assessment and when the teacher knows whether they have passed okay. it or not. So, so this will speed that up. Right. So the reason why I ask this question is I actually do this in my classroom now. And there is an online free uh, multiple choice test that you can take as many times as you want to offered by the Department of Homeland Security. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how is this different from the program that any teacher could get online and do for free? So one of the features that this allows us to with this um, agreement is that we'll be able to download the results and load it to Infinite Campus so okay. that our counselors, assistant principals, principals, mm -hmm. when they're checking for gra meeting graduation requirements can do that. And that's not something that's necessarily available through um, the federal. Right. Okay. That answers my question. Thank you all. Um, Thank you. Uh, Board Member Brady. Uh, out of curiosity, um, so this, uh, how, what's the cost of this agreement? It's free. It's free. Awesome. Uh, so, yeah, so there's that answers that question. Uh, and this is as a result of the uh, legislature uh, passing a civics requirement for uh, high school students, correct? Correct. All right. And the actual test yourself, because you do, you do mention that there is a lag time, but that actual civics test that the legislature has mandated, uh, students have multiple chances to take that. Correct. Is it how many chances do they have, or is it unlimited? Uh, uh, unlimited until okay. they pass, so they can graduate. All right. Thank you. Is there a motion to receive uh, item XR1 recommendation for approval of memorandum of agreement with the University of Kentucky College of Education to implement online civics assessment? Is there a motion to approve that? Board Member Craig, seconded by. Uh, uh, Dr. Chris, all those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. The next item that was pulled down is item S, recommendation for approval of the naming of the library at Cochrane Elementary School, the Nancy E. Sutherland Library. Uh, to clarify the Cochrane, this is Cochrane, that is C-O-C-H-R-A-N-E. Uh, Mr. Brady, you pulled that item down? Yes, this is Cochrane with an E. Um, I just wanted to pull this down as a separate item for a separate vote for the record to reflect that because of the dedication of Nancy Sutherland, who was a uh, school secretary that uh, for Cochrane, and she had served at schools for over 30 years. And I wanted to have this as a separate item that uh, was noted in the record. Is rather there than just clumped in together with the rest of the consent calendar. 
Is there a motion for the recommendation for approval of naming the library at Cochran with the E, the Nancy E. Sutherland Library? Motion by Mr. Brady. Is there a second to the motion? Board Member Shule, all those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. The next item that was pulled down is item U, recommendation for approval of comprehensive school improvement plans, TSI schools, and review of gap goals. Ms. Duncan pulled item U down. Ms. Duncan? I just had, it was really a curiosity question about uh, when, when we have goals <coughs> that vary so greatly, I know why they vary. I mean, all, all of us know why they vary, why Great House's goals will look entirely different than other schools' goals, like Blake or I any other school. Uh, but what do we tell the Department of Education when they see this? Because they, they I, I, I have seen this repeatedly presented as uh, things being below the state average, uh, and like we're all supposed to be at the state average, and we have schools that are above the state average, and we have schools that are below the state average. So how how do we explain this to them when they ask for, or when they see how, how what gaps we have in our goals among our schools? So we actually followed the state guidance in setting these goals, and so this is how um, the state sets their delivery targets. Now they didn't set delivery targets for uh, this new round of accountability results. However, the, the method that has been used in the past is to cut the distance between where you currently are and 100% proficiency in half by 2030. And so many of our schools um, set their goals using that KDE method. And so they should be familiar with it because that's what they've but, used in the past. But they, but do they understand why there is such a difference so school it, to school? Yes. So it will, depending on where you are and how far you are from 100, your um, goals will be different um, based on your baseline data. So if I'm a school um, that's at 50 percent and I have to get to 100, I'm going to cut, that's 50 points, I'm going to cut that in half, I'm going to cut it to 25 by 20. 30, but if I'm a school at 30, my baseline is 30 and I have to get to 100, that means I have to go 70 points, so to cut that in half, I have to go 35 points instead of okay. the 25 points for the school A. So yes, you will see school, um, and I kept the math simple, um, you will see um, schools' goals differ depending on their baseline yes, I, data. I, but nobody ever questions that. Everybody no, just thinks they're... Yes, that's okay. their typical. All right, very good. Thank you. For doing that. Okay. Any other comments? If not, is there a motion for the, to approve the recommendation? This is item U, recommendation for approval of comprehensive school improvement plans of TSI schools and review of GAP goals. Is there a motion to approve that? Board Member Duncan, seconded by Board Member Craig. All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Dr. Dossett. The next item that was pulled down was item Z, recommendation for approval of school fees for 2019-20. Board member Brady, pull that item down. Mr. Brady. Thank you, Chair Porter. Uh, I've had an ongoing concern about school fees for quite a while now, and um, it just seems to me that there's been progress that has been made by the administration regarding setting some uh, basic levels and some basic fee structures as well as uh, caps on some of these fees. Yet, when I take a look at some of the individual fees that are as, uh, as, as, I don't know, uh, presented by some of these schools, uh, one, in some cases, you'll have a band fee that is $50, even though the instrument rental fee is capped at $40. I've told that, well, that you might have reads, for example, Okay, in some degree, then I'm penalizing a saxophone player as opposed to a trombone player. Uh, I, I, and then we have issues where some uh, the, the have cheerleading at one elementary school is $100. They have cheerleading at another elementary school is $30. There are, is a wide discrepancy all over the place. There's even a school in here that charges students to be on the student council. Uh, I, I just, some of these fees just seem, one, ridiculous, like the student council one just seems silly to me off the top, uh, just on its face. But two, uh, I understand that, you know, students who are, uh, 
you know, disadvantaged uh, socioeconomically, that, you know, their families don't have the money for it, you know, they can, they don't have to, this won't be a barrier for them to participate in these things. But at the same time, though, I know that there's a number of students out there, a number of families that don't want to be seen as that, don't want to be seen as not participating or uh, paying their fair share for a program. And plus, I just think it since a lot of our programs and schools from the get-go on unequal footing. Uh, I think that there needs to be a base level that we're providing as a school district or at least a base rules or a playing field, an even playing field for everyone to play from. And if a school really wants to concentrate or focus on a program, awesome, fantastic, have at it, but build either a, a booster program for it or provide some other type of structure to, to really focus in on that. My concern is that I don't want to penalize one kid who is assigned to go to a school in one area of town at a disadvantage or even at advantage over another kid from another area of town that's going to a school because of their cluster, their zip code, their, whether they're in a uh, special alternative school or a magnet school. I just think that there's something, something inherently in, uh, unfair about having inconsistent uh, fees across our entire district. Well, I, I appreciate the fact that, that you mentioned that we had made some progress on the school-based fees because in 2016, that was feedback that we heard from this board that said that um, for, for basic core um, um, school-based fees that there should be some consistency. And so the principal communication got together and set forth those guidelines. Where it starts, where you start to see that variation is for the for a lot for the extracurricular activities because in the example that you gave for a cheerleading program, you, you may have one program who, who decides that they want, they want to participate in choreography, competitive cheer competitions, and, and, and another school for an extracurricular activity who, who doesn't make that decision. Um, it's also another point that you made um, a moment ago was that um, if for a school-based fee, um, students who qualify for free and reduced lunch are not required to pay that fee. And with regard to the extracurricular fees, our principals have assured us that a, a lack of student funding will not want, will not be a barrier, and that's something that 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 we have re, that we have emphasized with our principals with regard to that. But in order for a school to be able to to charge a fee for uh, um, a, a competitive cheer program, the the board does have to uh, approve any new fees for that. So that's why that that rec why that recommendation um, is in is in front of you this evening for the, for those new fees. And I will add to that the difficult part and and. I understand that. I share in that. Um, I have a daughter in choir that costs a lot, um, that, and so I understand that. I'll just leave it at that. Um, but I think the challenge will be if we standardize the extracurricular fees, we will have to standardize the experiences that every school has, which will be a challenge um, to say that cheerleading will be exactly the same, band will be exactly the same, choir would be the exactly the same at every single school with the experiences that they get, whether that be additional training or support or trips or competitions, um, that's gonna be the challenge with that. Um, so, I mean, we, we have really worked with our principals to ensure that, that that is not going to be, that exclusion will not be a part of this. Um, but I understand that concern as well. I guess my concern is that exclusion already is a part of this because you already have schools who, who do go and go to these competitions or bands that do march or all these other maybe extra extra things that one school has on you know that another school doesn't offer and because we have an assignment plan even if those neighborhood schools or whatever that wouldn't that doesn't really matter that's immaterial to this because we do have to manage where kids go to school. But there's something, you know, we're, it's, our, it's already unequal. There's already exclusion built into the system. So my concern is just having a base level, and if, there want, if, if a school or a program really, really wants to focus in and expand that, then I think there should be another mechanism for that. Right, and an, another piece that, that we had put in place, particularly at the high schools, was uh, pr provided a supplement to, um, to the um, act to the vending stuff or to the to the supplement to the school for extracurriculars, uh, because uh, in a lot of the athletic programs in our high schools, football and basketball gate receipts uh, sustain those programs and also help support the others. So for the for the past few years, we have provided um, um, supplemental money to schools who have 
uh, low, um, who have lower uh, football gate and basketball gate receipts because um, in order to help those schools fund those programs and, and some others. So there have been some pieces that, that, are, that are in place for that. And, um, and also in the, um, one of the items that was already recommended is booster organizations. We, we do have those and the opportunity to establish a booster uh, organization do, does require a, a, a number of steps and a number of uh, uh, processes in place and, and, and there has some complexities uh, associated with it as well. But um, if, if a principal comes to us and says that uh, there are opportunities that, that they want for students with regard to extracurriculars, our athletics and activities department is, is, is willing to, to work with them however they, they can. And, uh, and also principals can, uh, you know, if, if there are issues pertaining to, those, to access uh, those there, but I would also encourage if you're saying that uh, that there are instances where students and families aren't participating in activities because of a, of an ability to pay, uh, I'll like take this opportunity for those families to to, re to reach out to the principal themselves, you know, individually, and let and let the work directly with the principal to ensure that those students have opportunities to participate in in, in those activities because we we want every student to participate because we know how much of a, a benefit it has for students to participate in, in co-curricular and extracurricular activities. Other questions? Also, uh, board members, we received um, in our question and answers, there, there's more elaborate de details in the response that we got back. Uh, this uh, question was submitted uh, for an answer, so there, thank you. Uh, for being and saying what you said, but if you need more information, if you go back to the question section where we submitted questions, there is more information there. So having said that and having the conversation at this point, I think we're ready to ask for a motion for the approval of school fees for 2019 and 20. Is there a motion to approve school fees for 2019-20? Board Member Geese, seconded by Board Member Craig, all those in favor of the approval of school fees for 2019-20, please raise your hand. All those opposed, all those abstaining. All board members um, that have voted yes were Duncan, Geese, Craig, Shul, Cobb, Porter. Uh, there were no votes and there was one abstention, board member Brady. Thank you for your answers very much. So moving on, I, I think I have covered all the items that have been pulled down. If not, tell me now before we move on to the board planning calendar. Hearing none, moving on to the board planning calendar. Is there a motion to receive the planning calendar? Board member Geese, seconded by board member Duncan. All those in favor of approving the board, pa board planning calendar? It's unanimous, thank you very much. Committee reports, are there any committee reports this evening? Hearing none, moving on to board reports. Are there any board reports this evening? No, nope. board member Brady. Um, actually, a couple of things. First of all, uh, a couple of us, uh, several of us, uh, had an opportunity to uh, go to the National School Boards Association uh, National Conference in Philadelphia during the beginning of spring break. Um, you know, I think that Several of us had the opportunity to be able to uh, meet and network with other board members throughout the country uh, and as well as uh, board members that were in uh, districts of like size or even bigger than us. Um, I think it was just a really a wonderful opportunity to be able to do that. Um, and I also want to uh, mention and to give an official thank you in the record for uh, to uh, Jeffrey Rosen, who is the director of the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia, for uh, his graciousness and his staff's graciousness uh, in taking the time to host uh, myself and Member Geese and Member Craig. Um, had the ability to tour that uh, wonderful uh, center. We highly encourage you to go visit whenever you're in Philadelphia. It is a great experience, uh, but also the fact that they took some time and their chief learning officer, or 
yes, Chief Learning Officer. I think uh, hopefully we'll be able to hook her up with our Chief Academic Officer to be able to provide our students with some extra resources to be able to study our, our Constitution. So that is something that uh, we're looking forward to. In addition to that, I also want to thank Ben Langley and all those associated with uh, Build-A-Bed. I know many in the cabinet over here had the opportunity to be able to participate in that, as well as Member Duncan and myself on the board. Uh, Dr. Polio was, uh, was also there. I think he got an orange shirt. I'm not quite sure how you got that. Uh, apparently, there were, we were uh, ranked this time by white shirts and orange shirts. Um, and. Uh, and so we had a wonderful time, even if I even if I got headbutted. Uh, so I have to throw that out to Dina. Uh, but it was a really great opportunity. We built about 158 beds to kids who just don't have one, and that's something you don't think about very often. In the fact that we have students in our school districts that literally do not have a bed, and this community uh, rallied as part uh, to build those beds. It was part of the mayor's uh, Give a Day uh, initiative. We've done this for the last several years, uh, but Ben Langley has been the uh, the engine that could and can and does uh, for this district regarding this particular event. And I want to say a special shout out to him and everyone who participated. Uh, it was really, a, again, another fantastic event. Thank you. Um, I also want to uh, congratulate Ben Langley and his team. The Build a Bed program has grown immensely over the last few years. It started at Mazik Middle School and has it's bigger than that now. So his team and um, Mr. Langley has been recognized uh, within Metro Louisville for the work that they do with the Build a Bed program. It is outstanding work. It grows every year. So thank you everyone that was able to be there uh, this year and uh, hold on because there will be another one next year. So thank you for your participation. Uh, I would like to recognize the board members that did have an opportunity to attend the National School Board Association uh, meeting in Philadelphia. That would be Board Member Brady, Board Member Craig, Board Member Geese, and Board Member Porter. It was a wonderful opportunity to hear uh, information from uh, various presenters on different topics. I had the opportunity to uh, hear Angela Davis at the CUBE luncheon. So it was a great event. Uh, moving on to the many things that have happened. We thought that nothing happened during spring break, but I would like to give a shout out to the spring break camps that are sponsored by the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Poverty. I had an opportunity on the closing day to visit Shelby uh, Traditional Elementary School and their topic, their focus for that week was chess. Everybody was totally excited. They walked in the room. No one knew one thing about chess, but by Friday, they knew a lot and they were excited. And so I said to them, I have two questions for you, at which point they frowned. The first question was, did you enjoy the camp? The answer was jumping up and down, yes. The second question was, would you come again? And the answer was yes. So thank you for everybody that made that possible. And the second camp I visited was at Inglehart Elementary and their uh, topic was karate. And uh, I would like to thank the instructors the schools that opened, the parents and relatives that visited the students on the last day to see the program, our school food services that provided lunch for the students, and the staff of diversity, equity, and poverty that made that possible. It was a huge success. The other thing I would like to acknowledge is that on um, Friday night, uh, diversity, equity, poverty, and the Greater Louisville Alliance of Black School Educators were responsible for the Educators of Color program at the Kentucky Center for African American History. Dr. Polio was there. Others of us were uh, at that event. It's a wonderful opportunity to thank people for the work that they do above and beyond. Very good crowd. It grows every year, so thank you everyone for making that possible. Um, People feel comfortable, they feel thanked, they feel appreciated. So uh, thank you again, Diversity, Equity, and Poverty and the Greater Louisville Alliance of Black School Educators. This is, I want to emphasize, a program for educators of color. So that is a diverse um, rec uh, nominations of people that are recognized at this event. Um, also, last week, during spring break, I had the opportunity to participate in a panel discussion of the Kentucky Association of Blacks in Higher Ed, uh, and that was held at the Hilton Garden Inn. 
And um, thank you for also to Dr. Dossett and Dr. Coleman, who joined me at Maupin Elementary School uh, last week. Uh, the NAACP and JCPS, uh, Diversity, Equity, and Poverty, have had a series of uh, information sessions. Uh, Dr. Polio was there with the Commissioner Lewis. Uh, Dr. Horton was there. Many staff members have been there to talk about the various programs within JCPS, so that happened also. Uh, I think that completes everything uh, that I have, that I can think of that supposedly during spring break week that we were busy. So I thank everyone for, for the work that you did and uh, other times also. And Mr. Brady raised his hand and Ms. Duncan raised her hand, Mr. Brady and then Ms. Duncan. My apologies. I, did, I would be remiss if I forgot to uh, invite everyone to see, and I'm going to admit because this person uh, pronounced his name wrong, but D. Morisso's play pipeline about racial equity. It's going to be at J-Town. Uh, their theater department is putting this on on April 23rd uh, through the 26th. And also around that same time frame, which I believe is going to be starting on April 24th, which is a Thursday, 24th, Friday, and Saturday, over at Stouffer Elementary, uh, they're going to present The Little Mermaid Junior. Um, you've seen plays at elementary schools before, but then there's Stouffer. Uh, the production quality on that is off-Broadway, but not too far off-Broadway, I might add. Uh, so that they, do, they really do it upright. And so I just want to uh, mention that those two... Uh, uh, theatrical events are happening uh, within uh, at J-Town and at Stouffer. So I apologize for leaving that out earlier. Ms. Duncan. I just want to mention I traveled to Seattle, Washington with the media class at, at uh, PRP High School and uh, they went there for a student television network conference and competed. We had uh, competed in three different categories and uh, Mrs. Fowler and her husband Mr. Fowler both teach it. Uh, PRP uh, were sponsoring this trip with us and uh, just a, a remarkable experience for all of us. Uh, we, we watched the famous fishermen throw the fish at uh, Pike's place and it was, uh, we, saw, we saw so much wonderful thing or so much wonderful stuff there. But the, then the experience of the, the competition was so great for the kids. And the, these were kids from all over the country coming in uh, to compete. So um, just appreciated that. And uh, to build a bit, I want to thank TJ Middle School, Thomas Jefferson Middle School. So many of their kids helped us. They would come to our teams. And we had a young man who helped us last year. He was the same one this year. His uh, name was Dorian. But... Uh, those uh, kids were just as invested in that work as we were, and it was uh, just a wonderful experience. Every year always is. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, board reports? Hearing none, there are no additional uh, persons to address the board. There is no executive session, and we've taken care of all the action items. So at this time, at uh, 9.55 p.m., is there a motion to adjourn? Board Member Geese, seconded by Board Member uh, Shul. All those in favor? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Welcome back. <laughs>